Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my wife told me that someone else is her soulmate. My wife, M, met her best friend, Chuck, back in high school. They became close friends, and Chuck came out to M. M was supportive. A year or so later, Chuck told his parents, and long story short, they kicked him out, and Chuck ended up living with M and her parents for the rest of high school. M and I started dating after college and she told me all about Chuck and how close they were and how he was like a brother to her. I met Chuck and we got along and became friends. He's a great guy. At the time, Chuck was dating a guy. They ended up moving in together about the same time that M and I got engaged. M and I have been married for five years now. I'm a project manager and I took on a year-long project in another city. I have to leave at 5.30 a.m. every morning and get home around 6.30 p.m. M and I had a long talk about my job before I took on this project. We knew it would be a sacrifice for me to be working so much, but I'm getting more money than I ever thought I would. After this project, we can pay off our student debt and start trying to have a baby. We both agreed the money was worth it since it's only one year. That year will be up in late November. In March, Chuck caught his boyfriend cheating. He was devastated. M immediately told him that he could move in with us. I was fine with them moving in, but was not happy that M didn't even discuss it with me first. Chuck was pretty broken up and M was giving him lots of love and attention. I was fine with it because I know how much she loves him and he did need her. I also did my best to support him and make him feel loved as well. For a while, this was fine, but as time went on, M has continued to pour all of her attention into Chuck. Sometimes I get home from work and neither of them are there and I found out that they went to a movie or out to dinner together. I don't think that there's anything romantic going on between them, but it has been annoying that I get left out of all the plans. The past few weeks, several things have happened. The three of us went to a party and someone joked about Chuck being our third wheel and M said, Chuck is not the third wheel. I said, what? And she said, I've known Chuck longer than I've known you. A week or so after that, M and Chuck went out dancing one night. I had to work the next day, so I stayed home. I woke up at about 3 a.m. and M was not in bed. I went and found her and Chuck cuddled up on the couch asleep with the TV on. Both of those things made me uncomfortable. I also realized I had been working so much I was just sort of letting M and Chuck plan everything and I had not planned a date night in a while. I decided I needed to be more active and so I planned a date night for last Friday. When I first told M she was excited as we have not been on a date just the two of us in a while. Friday, I got home at 6.30 and M and Chuck were not there. I took a shower and got ready. About 7.15, I called M as we had reservations for 8. She answered and when I asked where she was, she said her and Chuck had gone shopping and were getting some dinner. I was kind of stunned and asked her about our date. She laughed and said, Oh, I forgot. Oh well. And that was that. She didn't even invite me to join them. I've tried to never be controlling of M or tell her what to do. I also tend to shut down when I get angry. When M forgot our date, I was mad, so I didn't say anything right then and there, but I knew I needed to address how I was feeling. So later that evening, I told her we needed to talk. I had written down some things so I could stay focused. I started by saying that I do love Chuck and he was always welcome in our home, but that I felt like our marriage was suffering and we needed to work on us. M blew up. She thought I was attacking Chuck. I guess I didn't word things well and she started defending him and coming at me. We have never had a big fight before. We always talk and work things out. I was stunned that she was attacking me over this. She said some really awful things. Then she said, Chuck is my soulmate and you just have to get used to that. I just shut down. I didn't even know how to process that. I love M more than anything in the world, but in that moment, I realized that she loves Chuck more than she loves me. I thought M and I were soulmates but to hear her say that she considers someone else her soulmate has been devastating. I don't remember the rest of the talk. She huffed off after a while and slept on the couch. Her and Chuck left together on Saturday and were gone for most of the day. When they got back, she's acting like nothing ever happened. On Sunday, she even made a small joke and batted her eyes to me, something she does when she's flirting with me. Normally I love it, but this time it just made me sick. I told her this was a busy week at work and I was just going to stay at a hotel near the job site something that I've done a few times before, so I haven't seen her since Sunday night. I don't know what to do. Typing all of this up has made me realize I'm really burnt out with all of this travel. Maybe I checked out too much and haven't given her enough attention. 
But how do I move forward knowing she will never love me as I love her? Minor updates. Seeing a bunch of comments from women who say that they have more than one soulmate has given me... given me hope. To me, you only have one soulmate, but that's not a word M or I have ever really used, and I just really hope that she means it different than how I took it. We've been texting back and forth some this week, and we spoke on the phone last night. It wasn't anything big. She just called and said that she misses me and couldn't wait until I got home. I'll be home tonight. I told her we should talk about our fight last Friday, and she agreed and said she hates that we fought and we need to work it out. She said she loves me. We'll be talking tonight, and I guess I'll find out where I stand. Update. When I took the time to think about all of this and type it out, I realized how burnt out I was. Friday morning, I met with my team, and I scheduled some time off coming up soon. I'm in a much better headspace now, knowing that I have that downtime. Em and I had our fight on Friday night. Then I left Monday and stayed out of town all week for my project. M texted me this Friday and said Chuck was gone for the weekend so we could spend time, just the two of us, and that she wanted to make up for our missed date. I got home Friday evening and we agreed to talk before doing anything else. I had written out everything I wanted to say and she sat there and listened. We talked for a long time and we each went back to some things to get clarification, so I'm not going to try and replay everything we said, just the main parts and the way that makes the most sense. I told her how I didn't like her joke about me being the third wheel and how much it hurt that she forgot our date and then how crushed I was that she said Chuck was her soulmate. There were some other little things too. When I was done, she said she was sorry and she was wrong for saying those things. She said I'm not the third wheel and I am her soulmate and she asked if she could explain why she had said what she did. When Chuck's parents first kicked him out in high school, he was really in a bad place. He told M's mom and they got him help. So when Chuck called in March about his boyfriend cheating on him, M had freaked out and was afraid that it could be a repeat of what happened last time. She said she felt like she needed him close so she could watch him and keep him safe. I had made a comment about how for the past six months, it seems like her and Chuck were living their best life together, and she said that she's been miserable this whole time, that she's been on the verge of a nervous breakdown. After our fight, she knew she was wrong and realized she needed to get help and let it go. She talked with Chuck and he promised that he was a stronger person than he was in high school. They agreed it was best if he moved out, both to give M and I time to work on us and so M wouldn't be obsessing over when he was coming and going. M wanted to talk to me last Sunday, but I had said I needed time and she wanted to give me space. It was a long talk with lots of tears. She apologized a bunch of times. She said she was so concerned with Chuck's mental health that she attacked me because she thought I was going to make him move out and she was lashing out. She acknowledged that she hurt me and said she loves me and she wants to work on herself and find ways to deal with her fear and worry in a healthy way. We've never really had a big fight before and we both agreed we could have handled it better. Her by not lashing out and me by not shutting down. We agreed to start couples counseling to help us learn how to disagree in a more healthy way. We were both emotionally drained after the talk so we just ordered some food and stayed in. We cuddled in bed to watch TV, talk and just be together. We've missed each other a lot these past few months and it was really nice to just hold her. The next day, Saturday, we went on a date. We went to breakfast, went shopping, saw a movie, and even got pedicures together. Several times throughout the day, she would just stop and look at me and say she had missed me and she was so sorry she had pushed me away. Today, Sunday, we called Chuck, who was staying with another friend. He said he was sorry he had caused so much stress for Em and me. He acknowledged he had been focused on himself and not even realized that we weren't doing well. He said he loved us both and is so grateful that we let him stay while he was getting over his breakup. He's looking at a few places and plans to be out in the next week or two. He did offer to move out right away, but I'm okay with him staying a little longer. I think having a plan in place is the most important thing. Our relationship took a hit, but we love each other and we're going to work on it. We set some boundaries and also agreed to always make each other our top priority. I have a few months left on this project, but we're going to make it a point to go on a proper date at least once a week and reserve some cuddle time on the weekends. Thank you to everyone who replied or sent me a message. I got some really good advice. I'm hopeful this experience will make us better and make our relationship stronger. I'm okay with this outcome. I totally see OP's side. I totally see where his wife overreacted and explained, but did not excuse her actions. But what I don't see is how Chuck just lived with two completely miserable people and thought it was all sunshine and rainbows. It kind of sucks that it was OP who had to clarify his lack of comfort and only then did Chuck realize he was taking advantage of his friends. 
All those women that commented to OP that they have more than one soulmate, I guarantee they would be furious if their husbands ever said that to them. I can't imagine being the Chuck in this situation. Never felt weird staying for so long and taking so much of the wife's time away from her husband? The atmosphere in the house doesn't feel right? Never made the effort to connect with OP in some way? So insensitive, self-absorbed, and selfish. I don't care how good a friend you were or how hurt or in a deep, dark place you are. You are a guest and a friend. Behave like one. Be nice to your hosts, including M and OP both. I think OP wants everything fixed, so he's willing to sweep everything under the rug based on a minimal apology. Glad they're going to counseling, though, as that may actually help them long term. Yeah, no. If my partner ever told me another woman was his soulmate, I'm sorry, but there's no apology or context that would ever make that okay. That is a relationship-ending sentence. I've got to say, I do not like that update. It's very gaslighty. She blatantly doubled down on Chuck being her soulmate, but then completely changes her tune? And the third wheel comment? I'm sorry, but everyone knows a third wheel is the person not in the relationship. And her actions don't seem to fit someone who's worried about their friend. It presents as someone having an emotional affair. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I'm really wondering if wife may have talked with Chuck about whether or not they could be together. Then after Chuck telling her that would never happen, maybe that's when she changed her tone and started apologizing to her husband. But that's just a theory. A Karen theory. Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit the golden child's baby after he disowned me for being adopted? Plus updates. I, 20, female, was adopted when I was 16 by my half-brother and his wife, who were in their late 30s at the time. They already had six kids when they adopted me, but it was never an issue. They've treated me like their own kid since they met me and later adopted me. So did all the other kids. Except for one, their golden child who's only four months older than me. We'll call him Chad. Chad has always been an insensitive jerk to literally everyone, including our other siblings. He would always fight with us, say mean things to everyone and get away with it. He also had extreme anger issues that would result in broken doors, holes in the walls, etc. He also got to do everything me and my sister were never able to do. He got a free car, goes out at night, etc. When we were still in school together during high school, he got up in front of our whole class and told everyone that I wasn't his sister and I never would be. He then told me in front of his friends that I would never be a part of his family and I should just get over it and walked off. This was not a one and done thing. He would keep doing this up until he moved out and I stopped seeing him and talking to him. Golden Boy once again got the limelight of the family after he got married right after high school, moved out to his wife's family's house, and then had a baby, the first grandbaby. Since this has happened, I've stayed as far away from him as possible, only seeing him for family pictures every year because our mother asks. Recently, I decided to come forward to our mom about what he had said and did because she was upset about how I was distancing myself from him. She basically pulled the, that's still my kid and it's my first grandbaby, card as the reason she wasn't going to be upset over it. I didn't really care to be honest. I knew it wasn't going to change her mind on her kid anyway. Out of nowhere, I got a message begging me to come to babysit for them because you're the only one who can deal with these kinds of babies because no one else will. Apparently, they're weaning their kid off of natural feeding and the baby is extremely clingy because of that and the fact that the mom is a germaphobe so they've only been held by like six people since birth. They know I don't sleep for the most part because I'm an insomniac with ADHD and I also am not bothered by the crying. For some reason, I can sit for hours with the baby crying and it doesn't bother me. Can't tell if that's a blessing or a curse at this point. My sister's mad at me because apparently they haven't asked anyone else in the family for help but me and everyone wants to go see this baby. Am I the jerk for not wanting to be around or take care of the baby because its father said that I'm not part of his family? Update. After I posted this, I ended up talking to two of my friends from high school. They were actually there during multiple occasions where Chad publicly said all of that stuff. I talked with them for a little while. One of these friends actually came over almost weekly when I was still living at my parents' house, so she firsthand understands my family. We talked, and we all mutually agreed, I go this once, see if we can't mend things. If not, I can tell my mom and sister that I tried, but we're done with the whole thing, and if the whole negative thing with my family keeps up, I'll just cut them off for good. So I accepted to go babysit. I went over to Chad's house around 8 p.m. As soon as I showed up, I was greeted by Chad's wife, who was extremely happy to see me. She was tired. You could just tell that she had the, 
I have a one-year-old face thing going on. She talked to me for a few minutes about how happy she was I came over and how she was glad to be going out with Chad. I kind of just listened to her go on and on before she finally got to the baby. Let's call him Seth. She explained to me his night route, feedings, etc. Nothing too big. Then she got to the end where she starts going on about how he was having crying fits at night and how he wouldn't get to sleep until mid-morning. I was a little eh on that, but all babies have difficult routes I guess. She then said they would only be gone for about 4 hours and that they would come home around 12.30, one at the latest. After this, Chad shows up from their room, literally starts talking to his wife, looks at me, and then just kind of looks me over for a minute and gives me a small wave and nod before heading out of the house. His wife follows and simply tells me to call or text if I need anything. For a minute, I was just stunned, but went to work to see Seth, which was odd because it was my first time seeing him in person and not in the photos that are hung around our partner's house. In person, he's the cutest little baby ever. He was fine the whole time, and he only cried because there was no one in the room, not because of the weaning. By this time, it was around 11.30, almost 12. I would check the clock every few minutes just to see what time it was. 12.30 rolled around, and I'm like, should I text them? And I'm like, no, let me give them another few minutes until I need to text them. I ended up texting both of them at 1, asking where they were, because they did say they would be home by now. I got no reply from either of them. They finally show up at 3 in the morning. I'm livid at this point, not even over having to take care of Seth for a longer period of time, but just because they never texted me back. Like, what if there was an emergency or something? They walk into the living room and I'm just like, I texted asking where y'all were at and no one answered. And Chad's wife starts saying that, oh, Chad said it was fine and that it would only be an hour more. And I was just like, you know what, it's fine, whatever, Seth is sleeping. She looks at me all weird and I just rolled my eyes and said, it's not the weaning that's making him cry at night. He gets lonely. He's clingy. Just let him know that you're in the room when he starts crying and he'll go right back to sleep. I started to walk out with my stuff. As I was right about to walk completely past Chad, when I turned around and was like, so you aren't going to say anything to me? After I looked after your kid for like seven hours now? He snorted at me and was like, no, my wife is the one who talked me into this anyway. Ticked off at this point, I said, so this wasn't, I don't know, possibly a way to be able to apologize for high school or maybe all those other times you decided to outcast me from the family? Because I was under the impression that maybe you wanted to patch things up because of you asking me of all people to watch your kid. He sat there for a minute and just said, Why should I apologize? Because literally nothing from high school has changed. Man, you really do need to grow up and understand that me and my wife aren't going to cater to you like mom and dad did because you're adopted. You ain't our family and you won't ever be. At this point, I just got in my car and left. I ended up texting my mom about all of it, thinking she would get it in the morning when she woke up. No, of course she had to be awake. She apparently told Chad's wife about the conversation we had about all the stuff Chad had said and done to me in school. Apparently, his wife felt bad because she had an adopted sister too and felt horrible that Chad had done and said all those things. Apparently, mom didn't know about Chad asking about the babysitting thing until now and she started talking to the wife who is now upset. Apparently, she thought Chad would have changed since then and didn't think he would act this way that he did when I left. I told my mom that I'm done with him and that if something ever happens with Seth, then I would be there, but I was done with them until that happens. The way things are going, I will most likely be cutting my whole family off because this isn't worth the stress anymore. Update. The first day or two after the interaction with Chad was a bit hectic. Both of them were blowing up my phone trying to get me to talk to them. Mostly my mom just making excuses for Chad and my sister trying to basically just tell me to get over it. I ended up telling the both of them in text and over the phone that I was over it and I would be cutting myself off completely from Chad and his little family. This sparked some anger but my mother soon went quiet and later my sister. Everything seemed to be going pretty good after that for a while. That was until a week later when my sister showed up unannounced at my apartment demanding that I take the blessing of getting to be around Chad's sheltered kid when no one else seemed to be able to, basically acting like it was some huge honor that I was asked to babysit. I almost snapped. I wanted to call her a jerk and tell her to get off my property and then not come back because I was just so sick of it, but I didn't. From my doorstep, I told her that if she wants to see the baby so bad, just go over and see it. It wasn't my issue to deal with and I slammed the door in her face and watched her leave. It's been radio silent now for a while, until earlier this week. 
I was scrolling on Instagram when I noticed that my oldest brother, the one that I get along super well with, and who has supported me about curing Chad off, his girlfriend and him have posted pictures of their proposal. I noticed the post had been made last week, but no one had told me, not even my mother. I texted my brother's girlfriend asking her about literally everything that was happening. She was surprised because my mother had said she had told everyone in the family about the wedding. She then told me that they would be holding a family meeting at my parents' house to talk about the wedding plans. I said okay. The meeting was for today around dinner time. I showed up and walked into the house and noticed that a lot of stuff was different decoration-wise. My parents had our family photos all arranged around the living room and a few random frames with multiple small photos in them as well. I noticed that they had replaced multiple small photos of specifically me from the frames and replaced them with now pictures of Chad and his wife and my older brother and his girlfriend. What were maybe six pictures of me on any of the walls? There were now two, a baby picture of me and my senior high school photo that are now in the hallway, not even the living room. I ignored it and didn't say anything. After a while, everyone showed up, except for, of course, Chad, who my mom pulled the, he wanted to spend time with the baby, BS. They all started talking about the people plans of the part, aka people who were going to be key parts of the wedding cast. I tried my best to listen and take in all of what my brother's girlfriend was saying. I noticed by the end of it all, my name was literally never added into any of the main plans. I wasn't mentioned at all in the plans. I started to question why I was there if I wasn't going to be in the main plans of the wedding. I was kind of like, why not just send me an invitation then? I went home and texted his girlfriend asking about what had happened at the little meeting. Apparently, my mother had told her that I wouldn't want to be involved in any of the wedding stuff and that it wasn't my thing. She called me unfeminine and that I wouldn't like doing any kind of bridal stuff because I'm not girly. She then said everything was set in stone now. My older sister is going to be a bridesmaid and my little sister is going to be a flower girl. My little brother will be the ring holder and my other little brother and Chad will be the groomsmen. And apparently, my mother also told her that because of what happened with Chad that I shouldn't be set at the family table but at a guest table. I will just be another guest at the wedding. I really didn't say anything back because it hurt. It hurt that my mother would say that about me, that I wasn't feminine just because I don't enjoy a lot of girly things in my spare time, that I wasn't going to be able to enjoy doing something like a wedding or be a bridesmaid. I can't believe she would say that about me. To be honest, I don't even know if I'm going to go. The wedding is scheduled for the end of the year. It sounds stupid and petty, but this hurt me. It hurt that I'm being outcasted, most likely due to Chad once again. As I'm typing this, my sister is texting me about how she's helping plan all the bride stuff. Update. Chad's wife is pregnant again. Am I the jerk for refusing to help my privileged wife cover her increased cost of living? So I, male 39, am married to the love of my life, who's 36. We only have two kids, ages 5 and 9, and we all live in a house in a nice small typical Scandinavian town. Our economy is mostly shared, more on this in a bit. I'm an engineer working as a consultant. Great pay and benefits. I make more than I spend. My wife has a master's degree in human communication, a horribly useless degree, even according to herself. Since graduating something like eight years ago, she's been unable to find a job in her field. Note, those eight years do include her second pregnancy and maternity leave. Here's the thing. My wife has very wealthy parents, like no financial worries at all wealthy. Thanks to them, her share of our house was gifted to her. I still pay mortgage on my share. They gifted her a brand new car. I drive my own. Each Christmas, they gift her $20,000. Her, not me. Besides that yearly gift, she has more or less been without income for most of her adult life, including when she attended university. She did hold a few odd jobs here and there. We share all family-related expenses, utilities, food, insurance, vacations, kids stuff, and so on, through a shared account, 50-50. Besides that, we have our own accounts, but many purchases go towards the family, house, kids anyway, so it's not like airtight. You know how it is. My wife recently got a part-time job, 15 to 20 hours per week in a clothing store. The pay is terrible, hours are weird, and she doesn't get along with the owner. Therefore, she's considering quitting. I'm telling her to go ahead, but also that even a bad job pays better than no job. In my opinion, she's a little picky with jobs, won't do cleaning, elderly care, and other stuff like that, despite those jobs being the ones that she's able to get without any qualifications. She keeps applying for jobs in her own field, but so far without any luck besides a couple of first-round interviews. The market is very limited. Because of increased cost of living, 
You all know the story. Her yearly gift and small paycheck don't quite cut it anymore. She tells me that she's barely making ends meet. Therefore, she's asked me to help her out by paying a larger share of our shared expenses. I basically said no. I told her that not many people are as privileged as her and that she really should be less picky or even consider requalification, new education or a new field of work. I felt bad telling her this, but also needed to be honest with her. I could help her out, but that just doesn't sit right with me, all things considered. So now, of course, according to her, I'm the jerk. But am I? Edit. My wife did full childcare for both kids, one year of maternity leave per kid. As of now, daughter who's nine goes to school and son who's five is in kindergarten. No childcare is needed. Chores around the house are shared more or less equally. And when describing her degree as terribly useless, I meant in terms of job possibilities, nothing else, and she agrees. Everyone sucks here. I'll probably get downvoted, but this is why having separate finances in marriage is a really bad idea. You guys are married and you have kids. You're meant to be a team. It's absurd that you've been paying a mortgage payment on your half of the house and that she keeps $20,000 annually from her parents. It's also absurd that you have a great job, she's working a very low-wage job, and you expect to keep splitting things 50-50 like your roommates. Helping her out doesn't sit right with you because you've been treating each other badly for so long. This whole arrangement needs an overhaul and apologies from both of you. Not the jerk, but you said your wife's parents are wealthy. They will not live forever. If your wife inherits their money when they pass, are you going to be willing to accept if your wife tells you that you still have to pay your half of everything on your own? Will you be okay if she takes a vacation and you can't afford to go because your half costs more than you can afford? Everyone sucks here. This is a weird situation. You're married and you're supposed to be a team, partners. You two need to sit down and make some serious changes to the way you've been living your lives. Do you even still love her and want to be married to her? I've seen a story before that was almost identical to this, but the genders were flipped. Everyone laid into the husband, called him a useless man-child, and told her she should divorce him. Hmm, I wonder why that's not what you are all saying this time around. Oh, I know, because here on Reddit, you always excuse crappy behavior as long as it's a certain type of person who is the one doing it. I ruined a romance scammer's life. Context. I'm a woman in my 30s with a reasonably good corporate type job in a field with lots of room for growth and I'm recently back into the dating scene after a decade. I'm kind of a would be a 10 if she lost 30 pounds looking girl. Beautiful face, a few extra pounds, but I never have issues getting a date. I'm not well off, but I'm stable and I have a bit of spending money. What happened? A few weeks ago, I met a very charming man from a Latin American country only a couple of years younger than me. Seemed very sweet, cuddly, intelligent, family-oriented, emotionally available, educated, and in a good profession back home in his country, and he had a lot in common with me. Chemistry seemed amazing. He was honest that he was in my country on a tourist visa, but was hoping to stay. I made it clear I wouldn't be able to help him with that, but we'd have a fun summer fling while he was here. If he managed to stay or come back, only then could we consider a real relationship. Then the other shoe dropped. A couple weeks and four dates in, during a text conversation about my work, he asked me to be his sugar mommy. I initially laughed and assumed it was a joke. He kept pushing and clearly said it wasn't. Of course, feeling insulted by this, I went off on him. He maintained it as a serious ask until I hit a nerve with my complaints about how embarrassed he should be to ask me this. Then he got angry and insulted me for thinking he was serious about it. No apology for being hurtful. Obviously, what I did next was take screenshots and cry about it to my closest friends. I was hurt that I was fooled into thinking he liked me and that he thought I needed to pay for a man. My friends started a fuse on what happened next. One of my friends started snooping more on his online presence. Together, we found out six different Instagram accounts that were him using different variations of his name and different photos of himself, all uploaded in batches. On Facebook, a similar pattern. All very scammy and suspicious looking. He had been foolish enough on one of his profiles, though, to follow and tag the employer that he was working for illegally on his tourist visa in my country. So I contacted another close friend in a local law enforcement agency that works with immigration. She looked up his file. He had a wife and a daughter at home. I released the hounds after that. The friend who helped me investigate online made several group chats on multiple platforms with all of his family, immediate and extended, and friends. She released all of the screenshots as well as a rant about how shameful it was. As they started blocking her, she added more people. I found his sister's phone number. 
sent her text messages there too. Everyone he knows, including his wife, knows he's unfaithful and trying to take advantage of others. 30 minutes after the online bombardment started, I got a rude message from him about how I should be smart enough to know he was joking and he doesn't need to sell himself. I didn't reply. Next step? Online immigration reporting form with all the info we found. Work info, employer name, and address. His home address. Full name, date of birth, photos, screenshots admitting to working. Usually these reports take months to be reviewed, if at all. But I gave the file number to my law enforcement friend. Two days later, law enforcement officers visited him at home. They found him with a phone number that was issued to a local resident. All his roommates also had numbers issued to the same person, a direct link to the employer. He received a caution for trying to scam me, a no-contact order, and a flag on his immigration file that, based on his country of origin, will likely mean he can never return, as well as a strict warning to not work without authorization. His roommates also received warnings. His employer received a visit next. They found significant proof that they had been employing him illegally as well as multiple other people. Their investigation is still ongoing, but so far, they're likely to receive tens of thousands in fines or possible jail time. The guy isn't getting deported because the government would have to pay for it and proceedings take longer than his remaining visa time, but now he's being upgraded from a flagged file to a multi-year ban on re-entry to my country. If he bothers me again though, he will be deported as well. Hope he enjoys going back to his angry wife and the ridicule from everyone he knows. See you again, never. Assuming his roommates aren't pulling the same stunt, I feel bad for them being collateral damage in all of this. It's one thing to go after him, it's another thing to cause a domino effect, which affects others who didn't do anything to her. Yeah, she thinks she did something good. She ruined more lives than just his. Some of those people could have been people trying to make ends meet and trying to better their lives given the hand they were dealt in life. Am I the jerk for trying to get my girlfriend to exercise? I, 26 female, am in pretty good shape. I jog every day and eating healthy is pretty important to me. I also follow a low-carb diet for health reasons. I used to have horrible IBS and mood swings. My girlfriend, Elle, who's 28 female, also eats fairly healthy overall, but I do most of the cooking. Before we got together, Elle mostly just ordered takeout and didn't cook much. We got together and she's pretty happy overall with our eating habits because I'm a good cook but she still buys processed junk food and less healthy items and keeps them around the house. I also bake a lot and Elle is always happy to try what I make. Last year, I proposed to Elle and she said yes. We're now in the stages of wedding planning. Recently, I noticed that Elle had gained some weight and I'm a little worried about her health. Early on in our relationship, things were closed because of lockdown and so we went on a lot of hikes together and we used to go for walks multiple mornings a week. This, plus the fact that I was cooking for us and she was eating less takeout and processed food, led to her losing about 15 pounds by accident. She wasn't overweight, but had gained some due to lockdown, lost some, and after meeting me, had lost the rest. I know living a sedentary lifestyle has its health consequences and it really isn't good for you. I really love Elle and I want her to be around for a long time. I feel like it's partially my fault that she's gaining weight because we used to go for more hikes and walks together. But then, I started jogging in place every morning while watching TV. It got too hot over the summer to walk, and I wanted more exercise. So now, instead of us going for a walk, I'm there jogging while Elle just sits and watches TV with me. I love Elle and find her very beautiful. I just worry about her health and her not getting enough exercise. Every now and then, I suggest she jog in place with me, or I'll send her on an errand to the grocery store so she can at least get a little walk in, and she's happy to go get things, but doesn't ever jog with me. Today, I tried to tell her that I was worried about her health and she got upset. I don't think I said anything bad. I told her how much I love her and how I want her to be around, but I'm worried that she doesn't get enough exercise. She took it fairly well, but was very quiet and seemed kind of sad. Later, I got an angry text from Elle's stepsister saying that I was shaming her and calling me a horrible person. Am I the jerk here? Edit. Okay, I see how everyone is focusing on the weight thing and I'm sorry if that's how it might have come off. My main concern is Elle's sedentary lifestyle. She sits around all day for work and some days we don't even leave the house. I apologize if I came off as being judgmental about what she eats or weighs. This has nothing to do with what she eats or how she looks. Her eating habits have gotten much better since we got together and I don't care if she eats carbs or some junk food here and there. I'm simply concerned because her life got a lot more sedentary 
and she started to gain some weight. My main concern is the sedentariness. If she were the same weight, but more actively moving around and getting her heart going, I wouldn't be saying anything. Just the weight gain was what made me notice how sedentary her life had gotten. You're the jerk. You're watching your fiancé's weight and not her soul. Get your crap together before you lose her forever. Why do you care about her health if she isn't overweight? This is a thinly veiled attempt to cover the fact that you have a problem with her figure. This thread disgusts me. You're the jerk. Yes, there's health benefits to exercise. Jogging in place isn't fun and it's not really a bonding activity. Go for walks again. Change up your routine in the summer if you have to, but for goodness sake, don't send her to run busy errands like a kid because you think she needs to get off her butt. Did I miss the part where you're also her doctor? You're the jerk. Don't pretend it's her health you're concerned about. She lost weight while with you and you preferred that version of her physically. Leave her health concerns to the medical professionals in her life. You're the jerk. Is Elle's doctor telling you she's in danger? Are you a doctor? Are you shallow? Or are you honestly tricked by diet culture and you think that saying for her health is anything other than a phobia? Not the jerk, but these conversations never go well. I hate the shaming label used anytime someone tries to talk about weight. There's a huge difference. Are we just never supposed to say anything about weight ever again? Ridiculous. You want to encourage a healthy lifestyle, which is good, but you're going to find very few people interested in jogging in place while watching TV. You'll have better luck compromising and doing things together again that will appeal to her. Also, maybe back off on the baking. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. If Reddit boy tried to encourage me to be more active, I'd, I'd, probably, I'd probably agree. I, we sit here reading stories all day. Ten minutes late and it cost them a fortune. Bobby was a CNC machinist, a good one and the only one. The company he worked for made an intricate product and his CNC part was crucial. The rest of the product bolted onto it. The finished product sold for tens of thousands of dollars. It took three hours to make this piece. Bobby would make three a day. He'd make one in the morning, take his coffee break, then make another and take his lunch break. That ate up 6.75 hours. He'd stay late to make the third part and make two hours overtime. His new foreman turned out to be more than a bit of a jerk. He tried to get Bobby to do other tasks and Bobby said no, as he needed to monitor the CNC machine during all stages of the cycle. Foreman complained to plant manager, who then told him to back off and leave Bobby alone. One day there was a bad snowstorm and Bobby was 10 minutes late. The foreman was there to greet him at the time clock with a grin on his face, holding a demerit slip. Bobby had clocked in a minute late the previous week, and the union rule said that if you were late twice within 14 days, you got 20 demerit points. Bobby and Foreman got into a bit of an animated conversation, and the union steward came over and said that Bobby had no choice but to take the demerit hit. So Bobby went to work. His shift was 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., but he usually stayed until 6.30 to finish the last part. Not today. At 4.30, he shut the machine down and headed for the door. The next morning, Foreman comes over and says that the assembly team is short apart. Yeah, I know. I'm working on it right now. It'll be done in two hours. But they need three a day. Why didn't you make three of them yesterday? Because my shift is over at 4.30 and I went home. What? You stay every night until the third part is finished. Bobby pulled the demerit slip out of his shirt pocket, looked Foreman in the eye and said, Not anymore. Bobby had done the math. Every week, instead of getting 15 parts, they were getting 10 or 11. Foreman tried to sweep it under the rug, but within a few days, chaos ensued. The assemblers had no core part, and their team went to the plant manager to let him know that production was falling. The assemblers liked it. They got to hang around yakking while they waited for the next CNC part to arrive. Eventually, there was a meeting with plant manager, union steward, and Bobby. Foreman tried to throw Bobby under the bus, saying that he refused overtime. Union steward pointed out that, as per the contract, mandatory overtime was only in case of emergencies, and this wasn't an emergency. Bobby had every right to decline the OT. Foreman lost his temper, started yelling at Bobby and Union Steward, and was asked to leave the meeting. Plant manager knew he was done for, and looked at Bobby and asked, What's it going to take to get you to work the overtime? Bobby smiled and replied, As long as Foreman is my supervisor, I won't be working a minute of overtime. And that was the last anyone saw of Foreman. By sticking to the contract, 
Bobby cost the company a handful of parts worth many thousands of dollars and put the company into a position where their lowered production would cost them even more in perpetuity. Bobby worked a couple of Saturdays to catch up and made double time for those shifts. They hired a new foreman who was explicitly instructed, do not, under any circumstances, mess with Bobby. Am I the jerk for calling my sister cruel for her tattoo idea? Sister is 28, I'm 26, male. My sister, N, has always had a strained relationship with our parents, especially my mom. I'm clearly not privy to the reasons because things are fine with me and my parents. When Anne went to college, she met her creative writing professor as a freshman and they got close immediately. They would do a lot together and worked closely on a few different writing projects. Anne never specifically said this, but it was obvious to anyone who saw them interact that they had a substitute mother-daughter type relationship, which hurt my mom a lot to see. I always thought she'd grow out of it or that the professor would move on, but 10 years later, they were still very close. About a month ago, the professor passed unexpectedly and it really devastated Anne. She was really depressed over the holidays, which of course was all in front of my mom and was a difficult reminder that Anne loved the professor as a mother way more than she ever loved my mom as a mother. She still talks to my parents and stuff and they don't fight or anything, but Anne is very distant and doesn't tell them anything about her life beyond the bare minimum. My mom tried to comfort Anne, but Anne was doing her distance thing and didn't want the comfort. Something unfortunate that happened to Anne is that when she got the call that she had passed, she was brewing tea, and in the shock of the news, she spilled the water on her arm, which left a mark on her wrist. I think the burn was like on the borderline of a second or third degree, and definitely still looked pretty rough during the holidays. Anne said it was especially hard because in addition to the physical pain, every time she looks at it, she's reminded of the moment that she found out the professor had passed, which I totally get. I was on FaceTime with Anne, and she said she talked to her tattoo artist friend, who said that the burn should be able to heal well enough to get a tattoo over it. Anne then explicitly told me about her idea, which is a type of flower that the professor gave her a bouquet of for her undergrad graduation. My mom was so embarrassed that day because she didn't get Anne flowers, but the professor did, and Anne was parading them around so happy, and it was a reminder of their connection. I guess Anne and the professor exchanged these flowers for every special occasion, like birthdays, etc., so now, she wants to get a decent-sized tattoo and a highly visible spot of something that will remind everyone of the professor. I told Inn that this seemed really cruel to my mom, who already feels cast aside and like she's in exile from Inn. And that's without the constant permanent reminder. Inn kind of scoffed and said, I can't believe you think you have the right to tell me not to do this. Called me a jerk and hung up, and is still not talking to me except for a very brief text saying, congrats for a promotion I just got. My parents aren't commenting. My dad said I should have just kept quiet, even though he agrees, and my mom made no comment but seemed grateful I stood up for her. I feel like I was just being protective of my mom. Am I the jerk? What you have described is the golden child and scapegoat kid. You being the golden child. In didn't get what she needed from her own mother, and she was incredibly fortunate that another stepped in and took on that role. Take your blinders off and see. Ask your sister if she felt second best growing up and be open and silent when and to what she tells you. Yes, you're the jerk. You're the jerk. Not much else to say other than it's okay for people to have meaningful connections to humans in life who aren't their parents and honor them and that connection however they want. It's not her problem to deal with her mother's pain or feeling left out. You're the jerk. Mind your own business. Your mom being embarrassed because she forgot to buy her daughter flowers is her own darn problem. We can all tell you were mommy's golden child from this post. Your poor sister. Not the jerk. Ignore all of these people insulting you and calling you names like golden child. Most of these people don't have good relationships with their parents, so they take out their anger on those who do. They also look for excuses to play the victim card, and calling you a golden child helps them feel better about their sad lives. The fact is, you love your mom, and you're just trying to look out for her. I assure you these people insulting you don't even love their parents, probably because mommy and daddy refuse to pay for their liberal arts degrees. Oh, you're also a man trying to get your sister to show compassion to your mother. Reddit absolutely cannot stand these sorts of scenarios. They think it's wrong of men to guide or lead others, which is why the US leads the world in fatherless homes at 23%. Gee, Maybe this is why we also lead the world in mental illness. 
Just like a classroom needs structure, so do our homes and families. When you have a society where fathers cannot play the role they've played for thousands of years, our current society is what you end up with. And it's exactly what certain groups in power have been working towards for a long time. Why? Because sick people who are hurting, lack direction, angry, bitter, unintelligent, and financially illiterate are the easiest ones to manipulate, control, and capitalize on. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his sister? Please let us know. Freak out over my child-free wedding? Okay, prepare to be embarrassed. My sister got married last summer. She had a very elegant and beautiful wedding and reception planned. It was child-free. She sent gracious notes to everyone who sent their regrets and thanked them for understanding her desires for her wedding and respecting them enough to RSVP in the negative. She also invited them to a party later that summer at her home if they wanted to take pictures with her and her wedding party in their fancy clothes. I thought it was well handled and classy. Several people did not understand the meaning of child-free and brought their kids anyways. One screamed through the ceremony and the mom would not leave the chapel because she did not want to cause a fuss. There were no extra places for them at the reception, so their parents had to share their food with them. The worst was the kid that wanted a cupcake off the table the wedding cake was on. He tipped the wedding cake onto the floor. My dad saved it, but there was a handprint on the lowest tier and a lot of cupcakes hit the floor. All in all, it was four families that brought uninvited kids. My wedding invitations just went out over Christmas. We're getting married in May. I know this is a long time, but we have a lot of out of town, country, and even continent guests we hope will come. We did not invite these families to our wedding. We have a Facebook group for the wedding for people to share pictures and memories that we might want to put in the wedding video. They found out about the group and posted to my personal page about being excluded and asking why we're not inviting them. I messaged them privately and asked them to take down their posts and explain that my wedding was smaller and I wasn't having as many guests as my sister. They went public again and complained about me excluding them for no good reason. So I posted the receipts. I posted a video my cousin sent me of the kid crying during the ceremony and the parents doing nothing. The video of the kid freaking out because he had to share trout for supper. The before and after pictures of the wedding cake table. And I also asked if they knew in advance that they were not supposed to bring their kids to the wedding. Then everyone started piling on them. I guess there was a lot of stuff I missed, including one of them changing a kid on the table with the guest book because the closest bathroom did not have a baby station. Now they're all calling me a jerk for embarrassing them for having kids and wanting to be part of family events. I said that they could not understand why rules were in place and that is why they're not invited. My uncle posted about how embarrassed he was that his daughter was one of these entitled jerks and offered to pay my sister for the cake that got wrecked. He had been unable to attend the wedding and hadn't heard about the cake. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. They tried to call you out publicly for making a decision about your wedding and you just met them where they were. They sound horrible. No wonder you don't want them at your wedding. Not the jerk. They tried to publicly shame you for not inviting them when they could have just messaged you privately and avoided the embarrassment. They don't get to try to publicly embarrass someone only to then get upset when it gets turned right back around on them, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. That they're, in the midst of all of this, still trying to justify why they brought their kids, despite explicitly being asked not to, only underlines even more that you did the right thing. Though a bit of advice, you may want to consider having some bouncers at the door to your ceremony and reception should they try to crash. Judging from, well, from all of this, it seems like that's at least a possibility. Am I the jerk for sending my partner to work with a lettuce sandwich for lunch? So I'm 28 male and my partner, 32 male, works full-time in construction. He makes decent money because he's like a supervisor, but he's very busy. He leaves the house by 5 a.m. every morning. I work a little doing some freelance document translation from home, but it's probably about 10 to 15 hours a week. I mainly make sure the house is in order and that my partner has everything he needs. Clean clothes, packed lunch, dinner made, house docked, etc. It's just the two of us. We don't have kids or pets. He does housework too, mainly outdoor things like lawn care or fixing anything that breaks. Anyway, I usually go grocery shopping on Fridays. So this morning I went to make his lunch and we didn't have that much. We were out of lunch meat, so I improvised. I sent him a lettuce sandwich. 
It was a thick layer of iceberg lettuce with tomato, onion, cucumber, Swiss cheese, and mayo on a large Kaiser roll bun. And then I sent a Tupperware of these seasoned crunchy chickpeas that I make in the oven, two Linder chocolate balls, and a can of flavored fizzy water. I thought it seemed like a decent lunch. Anyway, my mom used to make lettuce sandwiches when we didn't have money. Well, he texted me that he was mad. He said, what is this? It's just lettuce. I said we didn't have any meat and I was just trying to put something together in the morning before grocery shopping. He said, this is not a lunch. I'm going to be hungry all day now. It's fine if we didn't have anything, but just tell me and I'll order in a lunch. Now it's too late to order anything because you made me think I had an actual lunch, but it's just lettuce. In general, he's not one of those carnivore men who just eats meat at every meal, but we do usually have meat. His job can be stressful, so I just apologized and said I'd do that next time. He didn't respond, but now like three hours later, he just texted, Yeah, you're sorry, but you don't really know what it's like to have to do hours of physical work on an empty stomach. I didn't respond, but now I'm feeling a little annoyed with him. Like, does he really have an empty stomach? It was a lunch after all. He's pretty big, like 6 foot, 220 pounds, basically no fat on him. So maybe he does need more. I don't know. In general, I know he works very hard and I get to have a relatively stress-free life. So I feel bad making his day harder than it has to be. But I feel like he's kind of exaggerating. Anyway, it's not going to be a big issue. And I already went to the store and I'm making homemade bacon double cheeseburgers and fresh cut fries for dinner. But I was just wondering if it's really so bad to send a lettuce sandwich for lunch. Edit. So the man is fed and happy. I didn't bring it up or act angry or anything. I just let it go. And he did apologize on his own after dinner. He basically said, Sorry, I didn't mean to be a jerk about lunch. But yeah, next time just let me know if we're out of meat and I'll order some food. And I just said, Yeah, sorry about that. My brain probably wasn't fully functioning that early. And that was it. Now we're chilling on the couch together, so all good. Oh, and the people wondering why I didn't have food in the house? This man housed an entire tray of enchiladas for dinner yesterday that I was expecting to have leftovers to send for lunch today. I was going to send that with a salad, not on bread, and some crackers and the chocolates. That's why I was at a bit of a loss this morning. Anyway, thanks for the responses. Lots of not the jerks, but you're the jerks from people who have actually been in my partner's situation, so I'll just be more mindful of that going forward. Thanks all. Not the jerk. It's not a lettuce sandwich. It's a cheese salad sandwich. Not the jerk. He shouldn't be taking this out on you. You prepared him a lovely, hearty, vegetarian meal. A couple slices of ham aren't going to change the impact of that meal overly much. He's being a baby and owes you an apology. You need to apologize or I won't be making your lunches going forward. But it was a cheese sandwich. I mean, a cheese sandwich with a bunch of bonus stuff, but still. I've had so many cheese sandwiches in my life. I think you could have let him know that you'd packed him a cheese sandwich if he normally has meat sandwiches, but not the jerk on packing a perfectly normal lunch of a cheese sandwich. No jerks here. I agree that the lunch was tiny for someone who works construction. That job is extremely physically demanding and most people I know who do this kind of work eat big lunches because it makes you very hungry. So yes, you did not give him enough food, but you didn't do it intentionally. His reaction was a bit over the top, but I get it. In the moment when you're very hungry, you're looking forward to a nice lunch and it's a shock to discover you have a lot less than you expected. Just ask him how much he needs for lunch and take this to heart. Not the jerk. Your partner is free to make his own lunches. Edit. To everyone arguing with me, I totally agree that OP should help out with their share, considering their partner bears the brunt of the finances. OP's partner's reaction was way over the top, and anyone who doesn't agree with that, I question how you treat others as well. I'd say my vote is probably more between not the jerk and everyone sucks here, as OP could have said, hey, we are a little light on groceries, so would you rather grab something out versus me making your lunch? Am I the jerk for telling my sister her baby's name is stupid? I, 21 female, found out not too long ago that my sister, B, who's 36, is pregnant after a long struggle with infertility and I'm pumped and can't wait to be an aunt. Last week was the gender reveal party where B broke down crying after cutting the cake and seeing that it was pink inside. Her and her husband are thrilled because they apparently wanted a girl. She said right then that the baby would be named Mary. 
For reference, B is a born-again Christian. She found Jesus during her third time in rehab. She'll go on and on to anyone who will listen about how she had visions of the Virgin Mary by her bedside telling her that she would get better, that the pain was temporary, and how she would do great things after recovering. That was eight years ago. She met her husband not long after that, in church, of course, and fell head over heels in love, saying that God made them for each other. I kind of just rolled my eyes at the declaration. Mary is just so old and boring. B asked me what was wrong. I was honest and told her that I thought the name was a little boring. At least she could do something like Miriam and make Mary a nickname. It's 2023. Kids will make fun of her for having an old lady name once she's older. I myself have an old lady name. Think Edith or something, and it's a pain. Kids in grade school constantly called me Grandma Edith and the sort, saying that I was destined to be an old hag who would live in the woods and have a crooked nose. I'm also worried for the baby. B isn't a reliable person. She's been sober for years and everyone still walks on eggshells around her. She used to run off to go on binges all the time, a few times leaving me home alone as a kid so that she could go get some more while our parents were out. She brought it up a few days ago, mentioning how she was hurt I didn't like the name and asked if I was being honest in my feelings. I told her I was. Mary is a stupid name. She'll get bullied in school for it. Or at the very least, if she goes to some kind of Christian school, it'll confuse the crap out of her because every other girl will be called Mary. She called me cruel and a jerk and accused me of hating her and not caring that she was finally in a good place in life. As if she hasn't been in a good place in life before and relapsed, leaving our parents in debt, paying for therapy and rehab that don't work, and letting us clean up all of her messes over and over again. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Mary is a perfectly normal name. Your suggestion of Miriam sounds a lot more old-fashioned to me. Regardless, you were extremely rude to your sister. Not the jerk. Honestly, you're right. It's 2023, and sadly, you still have people naming their babies things like John and Mary. But considering the fact that she is a Christian, good luck trying to talk any sense into her. This is why I spend so much time on Reddit. People who comment here are usually smart enough to not do the whole God thing and it shows because of how intelligent we are. Am I the jerk for abruptly quitting my volunteer work with Pelicans? I study zoology in university and as part of our degree, we're supposed to get a certain amount of field experience. Also, most good zoos and animal internships demand it. So when our ornithology professor mentioned a volunteer opportunity with Pelicans through some local group, I thought that sounded cool and I signed up and was one of two students chosen. It was supposed to be the two of us and a professional helping to band young pelicans for research. Whenever you slip a little band around their ankle, that's unobtrusive to the birds, but useful for tracking purposes. So the three of us got out to the island for a long day of pelican banding. The professional showed us how to do it and how to deal with an uncooperative pelican, and then I gave it a try on one and I did it right. But then the third pelican I tried it on threw up all over me as I was doing it. I let it go and started gagging and really felt nauseated. My whole lap and shirt were covered in it and the smell was horrendous. I just sat there retching and trying to wipe it off, but to not much avail. After a few minutes, the professional said, Hey, come on, we've got a lot more to do. I've been thrown up on too already. Nothing to worry about. But I said, no. I'm not going to get thrown up on 10 more times today while doing this. I can't handle that. He got annoyed and said, Really? You're going to leave three people's work with just two people for the day? We said it would be messy work. I thought, well, not this messy. So I just sort of sat there for a few hours while they worked and tried to distract myself from the vomit-stained shirt with my phone until it was time to leave. The trip back was crappy too. They both stunk so bad I couldn't take it. Needless to say, my professor is mad at me, but I'm not sure what I was supposed to do. I would have gotten sick myself if I had kept at it, so I feel like I did the best I could. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk, and probably in the wrong field. Maybe switch to paleontology. No throwing up when they're fossilized. You're the jerk. You were there being stinky all day anyway, but instead of being useful, you messed around on your phone. The whole point of field work is to show you what doing the job in the real world would look like. Sounds like you found out that you're studying in the wrong field and need to adjust your sales. 
My neighbors cut down our trees to improve their view. So I live with my parents as I'm only 14 and my parents decided they wanted a holiday house that they can work on and use to get away from life. When we moved in, we talked to the neighbors. On one side is the nice neighbors, a lovely couple who have just moved into their first house. And on the other side are the entitled neighbors who rent their house to any people who want to have parties. When we look around the garden, we see three very tall trees, healthy trees which have probably taken about 200 years to grow. And as we are on a dip, these trees block the view of the house on the other side of the dip very well from seeing into my parents' room and bathroom, which doesn't have curtains on the windows. I think you can see what's about to happen. We have to go back to our other house so my mom can go back to work when my mom got a call from the nice neighbors and this conversation ensued. Hey, you need to come back here right now. The entitled neighbors are on your property with chainsaws and I don't know what they're planning to do. Wait, what? Can you stop them? I'm so sorry, but my ferry is about to leave and I need to go to work. However, I can call the police if you want. I know all of them very well, so they'll come quickly. Yes, please. I'll get my dad to get on the next ferry and get there as fast as he can. However, when the police got there, they were gone. I had just gotten out of school and because my dad needed to pick me up, I went with him to see what had happened. When we got there, we see this view. The three trees are gone and what is left are three very hacked at tree stumps and some glass. They had cut down our trees and in the process smashed parts of the glass wall around the deck. Hearing chainsaws, we look over. There's no fence yet. We see three mid-30s men cutting wood up, probably for firewood. This is when the entitlement really starts. Hey, why did you cut down our trees? Oh, hey, we were just looking over to your side and noticed that if these trees fell, it could really mess up your house. And being new neighbors, we thought we should do the neighborly thing of cutting them down for you. A sort of new neighbors helping each other out. What? Those trees were really healthy. Also, you trespassed and cut down our tree without our consent. We're calling the cops on you. The neighbor got so angry at my dad for saying that. What the heck, dude? We improved your view and made sure the trees wouldn't hit your house. We helped you. Why call the police on us? Now, my dad hates being called dude. Also, he's a lot stronger and bigger than they are. So he just walked inside while I stayed standing there, not really knowing what to do. Then the oldest, like 40 years old, looks at me and says, Hey, sweetie, if you stop your dad from calling the police, we'll give you an ice cream. I just turned around and walked inside, as the way he said it was so creepy. Fast forward about a week, and we find out that the trees they cut down actually blocked their view of the sea, and them cutting the trees down helped the view from their rental. Now they've been fined a lot of money and have to do some community work, as well as pay us enough money to put up a fence so that we don't have to see them anymore. Entitled neighbors have also started to rent out, so hopefully we don't ever have to see them again. Edit. I just found this out and I need to share it. 1. My mom has added trees, but they'll take about 100 years to grow tall. 2. We're figuring out the boundary so that we can plant bushes so that the fence is harder to build, though that does unfortunately mean I can't paint it. 3. For everyone saying build a high fence, the build limit on height for fences will not allow this. And 4. Turns out they have a dog that used to go to the bathroom on ours and the nice neighbor's yards, so nice neighbors are prepared to watch them build this fence while we are not at the house to make sure that they don't do anything wrong. My parents are demanding I pay rent and calling me a freeloader just because I have a video game addiction. I, 22 female, have been diagnosed with depression and gaming addiction. I hold a stable job making a very good salary and I've moved back in with my parents to save up for a down payment as well as their general concern over my mental state. To be frank, I have no hobbies other than gaming and the only social life I have is playing games with IRL and online friends. However, after I graduated university and came back, my parents have elected to smash one of my monitors, cut my ethernet cord and now physically take in my PC due to arguments over my gaming habits. After work, I come home and play games until I go to sleep, and over the weekends, I play games the entire day. It's been going on since two weeks ago, and they're refusing to give me back my PC, even though my psychologist says that this is doing more harm than anything. They call me childish for not being able to control my own habits, despite the fact that I'm holding my job. This has caused me to become more depressed than usual, 
With my days now often spent 95% of the time with me in bed aimlessly scrolling through social media. I'm back on my antidepressants and they seem to think that this is the better alternative. I have voiced this opinion countless times, but they refuse to listen to me or my psychologist and I have a letter written from them. I used to pay a much above average monthly rent for my one bedroom and washroom that I share with my siblings. However, this month I refuse to pay my rent since they're treating me like I'm a kid. And as a kid, they don't have to pay rent. They're now calling me a vindictive jerk and a freeloader because I'm no longer contributing to the household. Edit for info. Some answers to questions I see in the comments. I moved back since I live in the same city. And the logic goes, if you're paying rent anyways, might as well pay it at home to keep the money in the family. I pay for half the electricity, Wi-Fi, and groceries alongside my rent. My rent by itself for a one bedroom, one bath would be considered way above average. However, I still end up saving money because when I live by myself, I do not cook and order takeout. I shower every day when I come home, just not on Saturday. I eat two meals a day, morning and night, since I do not like eating outside the house. I don't cook. I have my own schedule where I will eat dinner, but when I feel like it, which is usually after they finish eating, after which I will do the dishes. Laundry and vacuuming the room is whenever I feel like it's getting too messy. I've paid for rent since I moved back, which would be since August of 2022. I've paid for soundproofing of my room, so there's less noise when I game. The majority of arguments are due to me not coming down for dinner when they finish making it. What caused them to destroy my properties the two times were, one, not willing to go to my younger sibling's school play, two, sleeping in until noon or afternoon during the weekends. You are correct to assume I do not get any exercise, but I get six hours of sleep regularly on the weekdays and however many hours during the weekends. Not the jerk. Move back out and do you. Don't leech off them or you would be the jerk. They're mistreating you with the destruction of your own stuff, a better reason to withhold rent. My son went to one of the best psych hospitals for a month inpatient and had similar gaming habits. They told me it's how he socializes with his autism and as long as he's happy and able to support himself, it's not a disorder. He has a full-time job now, he's 23, and 100% of our family's love and support. We even play with him. You may get a lot of varying opinions or mean comments. Ignore them. No one but you gets to decide how you spend your free time. As long as you're not harming anyone and you're not burdening anyone, enjoy it and don't feel guilty. That ought to help with the depression too. Traditional socializing is overrated. I'm 50 years old and I've learned that most socializing is superficial anyway. The close relationships you have, including those online, are all that matters in life. Not the jerk. You're a grown adult. You have a job and you're actively saving money. And unless they are outside every day cutting lumber or hustling money, when I'm sure they're just probably watching TV all day or playing on their phones as most old people do when they accuse people of being kids, forget them. I'd be calling police for destruction of property, to be honest. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her parents? Please let us know. All I know is I really want to play some Red Dead Redemption 2 right now. Oh man, that game is so good. You know your rights? Okay, go for it. Background. My ex and I were three months into separation as I kept suggesting divorce agreements, trying to find what she would accept other than take her back and return to being a doormat for her. I have a good head for legal documents and understood very early that as much as I would prefer to just burn everything down and disappear, legally it was very likely I was going to be paying alimony and she was entitled to a fair share of everything. But in a no-fault state with no gender preference, it did mean a fair share. It was clear that legally, I would not get an approval for an agreement heavily biased in her favor. So I kept reworking and sending possible divisions. Every few days for months, she would object to anything that put any responsibility on her, anything that left something of value out of her hands. Anytime I asked her what terms she would be okay with, she would just derail the conversation into something else. Not long into this, I realized that I would need a paper trail, so everything went to email only. Through all of this, I had recognized too that a court would order spousal support, so there wasn't any point in just cutting her off financially. Not a total doormat at this point though. I had moved my direct deposit to a solo account and kept up her weekly cash flow. I kept paying the bills, but my final offer in this period was the heavily unbalanced offer of splitting the cars one to each, me taking all the debt, including her student loans, 
paying her three to four thousand dollars a month for a year so she could get her feet under her and she gets all of the stuff. I walk away with my cars, my dogs, some tools, and some clothes. No go. Not good enough for her. And so we get to the meat of the story for the malicious compliance. Three months in, I finally get her to agree to a mediator since I'm getting nowhere. She shows up to the initial meeting, the first time we've seen each other in a while, the second time since splitting. She was staying with her sister. The mediator starts out with the rules of mediation and the agreements to sign. I sign easily. She balks, but signs it finally. One of the relevant terms is that we agree to not file any other legal paperwork. We would come to an agreement and the mediator would file the final court papers on both of our behalfs to get the divorce ordered. The mediator starts asking basic questions and every question to either of us results in my ex launching into an irrelevant topic attempting emotional manipulation of me or him. I quickly resolve to gray rock her directly and only direct my interactions to the mediator. I do my best to ignore her off-topic ramblings and reply to the mediator when she briefly crossed relevancy like someone falling from a tree and briefly being stopped by various branches on the way down. The peak was when she literally crawled on top of the big table to stick her face in mine to force me to see her and engage in her ranting. The mediator called it quits at that point. He reminded her of the rules she agreed to, gave us homework to fill out, and had us schedule the next meeting with his clerk two weeks out. Three days later, I get served with a summons to court for a hearing over spousal support. The summons shows the claim my ex made that all I had received from her in three months was $130. Oh boy, not true at all. Not to mention in violation of the mediator terms. I end up on a conference call with the ex and the mediator as he tells her that she needs to withdraw the complaint or mediation can't continue. She adamantly insists that she knows her rights, so the mediator ends his involvement cuts us refund checks, minus time worked so far, and exit stage left. I prepare for the hearing. I print out three months of bake statements and highlight every transfer to her, every bill paid on her behalf, every ATM withdrawal by her card, over 100 toll bills I received from her just driving through express lane tolls, so I got the elevated license plate fee mailed to me. $13,000 in change. You missed a couple zeros in your complaint, I thought. My final stack of papers was rather thick, so I made and printed an Excel spreadsheet summary for the cover sheet. I also looked up the spousal support rules again. It is 40% of the difference between the income goes from the higher paid to the lower paid. Some little wiggle room, but that's it, simple. She was currently getting up to 72% of my pay once you factored her bills in. This court hearing was a good thing. Not as good as a mediator and fast resolution, but I wasn't likely to end up done more here. Not to mention I had some daydreams of her finding out what lying on court documents might do. Court date rolls around, I show up to court, waiting in the hall outside the family law section. She shows up and plops herself next to me and starts going off on me again. I try to ignore her. Then to keep from engaging, I start a written transcript of her ranting using the back cover of my paperwork folder. Finally she realized what I'm doing and ends the ranting with, oh. I guess you are writing what I'm saying so you can make your friends hate me. They needed no encouragement. She huffs a few seats away from me and is quiet the rest of the time we waited. The court officer, not a judge, just someone authorized to handle it since it's a simple and clear legal process, finally comes to get us and we head in. The officer starts the legal speeches, yada yada, then asks my ex if she has anything to add to the complaint. She launches into a roller coaster speech, proclaiming all my bad faults some of which were real, how mean I was to try to divorce her and how I obviously didn't need any of the money that I made because he is just going to live somewhere simple and cheap anyway. Yeah, her words. The court officer returns to the present like someone climbing down from the kitchen table after seeing a rat run by and she asks me if I have anything I'd like to say. She can see the stack of paper and eyeballs it as she's talking. I hand over the stack tell the officer that the summary sheet on top should help clear up the financial points in question and just verbally start going through the items. At each one, my ex interrupts to give a reason why that item shouldn't count. Every single one. The officer keeps asking her to stop interrupting, but to no avail. We finally finish the list. The officer is shaking her head slightly and says, Mr. Yen, the court process is to ensure that both parties are doing the right thing. So all of the and gestures to encompass the stack of paper needs to stop right now 
We will garnish your paychecks for the amount specified by law and send that to her instead. I know it's a win. I knew it was going to be. She didn't. She sat there all smug as we get into the calculations. I asked for a couple of adjustments to keep the amount of her car payment since I co-signed and I wanted to be sure the bill was paid. I expected that she would refuse or overspend on other stuff and be unable to pay it. I didn't want to give her the power to trash my credit. The officer agreed. I then asked to keep the insurance payment amount too, for much the same reason, also agreed by the officer. My ex continued to be smug. I know she was thrilled at the idea of getting a court check directly. It sure would show me. Everything wrapped up. We got the totals, signed papers, I handed over a check for the first payment, and the officer got to make copies of everything. I asked the officer if I could wait in another room while she did and got an agreement with a bit of side eye at my ex. I got my paperwork first, with the officer saying, it might take a few minutes for her to get her paperwork, but you're free to go. I got the hint and left immediately. I had parked a few streets away anyway, another barrier if she couldn't park near me. I got in my car and immediately called my cell carrier and canceled her phone. Does she want to set up her own plan? I can't answer that. I'm obeying a court order to remove her from my accounts. Okay. And worked down the remaining subscriptions I was paying for that she used. I even had the bills in front of me from court with account numbers and customer service numbers right there. I was done and driving home when she started blowing up my phone with incoming emails demanding to know what I was doing. Then texts from her sister's phone. Then calls. I just grinned and didn't answer any of them. She stopped after an hour or so and gave me a few hours of silence. Then an all caps email with a screenshot of the Netflix inactive account message. OMG, even Netflix? I admit I giggled. The fallout wasn't over though. A month later, after she realized how much less she has from me after winning her case, she files an appeal. It's denied due to lack of reason. A month later, she files a complaint that I wasn't paying her car payment, just an excuse to get into court. I had been paying it, and I was also pretty confident that even if I hadn't, she didn't know how to get into that loan's account. She legally could, just never had cared to learn how. I had a lawyer at this point, and we both go to court. She's going to join by phone. The officer paused before calling and tells my lawyer, this lady is a piece of work. The validation of that statement will always remain with me. The call goes predictably. My ex makes irrelevant rants. The officer keeps shutting her down. Finally, asks my ex for proof that I wasn't paying the car payment, as she's holding statements and check images proving I had. My ex nearly screams, I just know he isn't, so he can hurt me. The officer replies, I'm holding proof that he has paid it and is satisfying his legal obligation. The complaint is dismissed, thank you, and hangs up on my ex. Divorce took another 10 months, lots more crazy, teaches her newbie lawyer a hard lesson, and I walked away with even less alimony than the spousal support, and only about 60% of the debt. I lost my dogs to her though, my only regret in the outcome. One is certainly past old age limits now, the other is in that range. I still miss them. Yowza! Stories like this make you think it might not be worth the risk of getting married these days. Am I the jerk for letting my daughter and her husband move in with me so they won't be homeless? This situation is complicated and I'm at my wit's end. I have two daughters who are civil to each other but don't get along with each other. My eldest is married to Steve while my youngest is engaged to Adam. Steve and Adam are so different they disliked each other the first time they met. Steve works part-time because he treasures family time with my daughter. They spend their time traveling and exploring different parts of the states. He spends freely because he often says he can't take his money with him when he dies. Adam is an executive and for his side business, he owns several dozen properties. He works about 80 hours a week at both jobs because his philosophy is that he wants to make as much money as possible while he's young so that he can retire early. Steve thinks Adam is a corporate shill and basically blames him for everything that's wrong with society. Steve said that Adam is actively keeping people from buying homes and making them dependent on him. Adam thinks Steve is a slacker and has told Steve people like him who do the bare minimum but expect handouts are what's wrong with society. Neither of them are bad and they treat my daughters well. I retired last year due to my health, so Adam built a house for me so that I can live comfortably. I was able to customize everything in the house to fit my taste. Adam owns the house, pays for all of the utilities, and charges me $1 a month for rent. Part of our deal is that no one else can live in the house but me. He was very clear about this. 
Steve recently lost his job, so he and my eldest are living off of her single income. As you can imagine, they're struggling. My eldest recently called me crying because their savings are almost gone and they can't make next month's rent. She asked if she and Steve could move in with me until he finds another job. I live on a fixed income, so I don't have money to set them up in another apartment. She's my daughter and I couldn't let her be homeless, so I let Steve and her move in. I gave them strict rules and a time limit on when they had to move out. I didn't think my youngest and Adam would even find out about it because they live in another state, but somehow she found out. She called and screamed at me last night for betraying Adam's trust, but I argued that I'm a mother to two daughters and I can't let one be homeless. I told her about the rules and time limit and begged her not to tell Adam. She hung up on me, so I don't know what's going to happen. I know I went back on an agreement, but I had a good reason. Edit. I couldn't add many details in the original post because I was afraid of going over the character limits. Adam pays the taxes and utilities on this house, but because it's the only house he has in this state, he keeps its financials separate from the rest of his properties. Also, he doesn't really have anything to do with the house. Instead, he gave it over to my youngest to take care of, so she handles all the bills and maintenance and pays them out of an account he set up. She noticed the increased utility costs, which is when she called. We just spoke again and I laid my soul bare to her. I know I was going back on our agreement, but it was to keep her sister from being homeless. We had a lengthy conversation and in the end, she agreed not to tell Adam. She'll cover the increased utility cost out of her own pocket so he won't notice it. In exchange, her sister and Steve will have three months, then will have to move out. I originally told them they had six months. I'm lucky to have such a compassionate daughter. Thank you for taking the time to read my post. Some of the comments were very hurtful, but some were helpful. You made me realize I should have called my youngest at the start and asked. That would have saved a lot of tears. You're the jerk. I'm sorry, but Adam is doing you a favor by letting you live in this house, and he gave you one rule, so he's not taking advantage of, and not only did you break this rule, but you did so by allowing the person who insults Adam to live there. Your daughter and her husband want to live by the values they have, fair enough, but they need to be able to have money to back that up. If by Steve losing his part-time job, they're in this much trouble, then they didn't have the money to spend freely and go traveling to begin with. Yeah, you have two daughters, but at the end of the day, the person who owns the house has no obligation to house your adult daughter and her husband, and honestly, you. So if you lose your home because of this, then you only have yourself to blame. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or not? Please let us know. I think when Adam finds out, which you know he will, he's then going to know that he can't trust his own wife to not keep important things from him. Oh, this is going to cause a lot of issues. My boss stole my Super Bowl tickets, so I made him lose a major client. I'm a huge 49ers fan. The rabid all-day tailgate in the parking lot type. A few years ago, we made it back to the Super Bowl. I was working at a consulting firm with a handful of accounts I would interact with daily. One client in particular knew how big of a Niners fan I was. I was the day-to-day -day lead on his account. He really liked working with me and we became friends, often grabbing drinks or dinner after our meetings. He had access to a pair of extra company seats to the game and as a thank you wanted to give them to me as a gift. He passed the tickets over to the partner on that account, who I will refer to as Jerkhead Partner, to be given to me as a surprise. The game came and went, we lost, it sucked. The next time we met, we went to drinks afterwards and he mentioned, Hey, by the way, why didn't you go to the game? I heard someone else was in your seats. I asked, What game? He said, The Super Bowl. Confused, I answered, I didn't have seats to the Super Bowl. He told me that he gave Jerk a pair of his company tickets for me as a gift so I could attend. I had zero idea what he was talking about. He looked shocked, told me to quietly ask around about it and get back to him. When I was back in the office the next week, I found out through one of the secretaries that Jerk had given a pair of Super Bowl tickets to another one of his clients as a gift from our company. I might have let this sort of thing go to keep the peace under different circumstances, but these were seats on the 30-yard line to see the 49ers play in the Super Bowl. I was ticked. I considered confronting Jerk myself, but realized it was the client who had noticed I wasn't there in the first place, so if I let him handle it, there would be no blowback on me. So I texted him, Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for thinking of me with those seats. It appears that they were given to another one of our firm's clients. He texted back right away in all caps, Are you kidding me? And then, Pretend I never told you. 
let me handle this. He followed up with me about formulating a plan. A few days later, we were asked to come down for a meeting in their office. The client requested the partner be present, not entirely unusual, so Jerk and I hopped a flight the next week and headed over to their office. Little did Jerk know, my client had orchestrated a wonderfully awkward little show to catch him red-handed. When we entered the conference room, it was all the usual suspects, along with a woman in her 30s we didn't recognize. My client immediately introduces Jerk. This is Stephanie such and such, VP from the other department. She wanted to sit in on this meeting. Hey, OP, you guys must already know her from the Super Bowl. She then responds as she goes to shake my hand. Oh, I don't think so. Did we meet there? I'm sorry if I forgot. Client responds. Gee, Steph, how much did you have to drink? They were sitting right next to you. Client looks at me and I say, sorry, I wasn't there. Are you thinking of someone else? At this point, Jerk is looking visibly uncomfortable, probably trying to come up with an excuse. He starts in with an, um, when Stephanie says over to him, no, so-and-so from the other company was in their seats. By the way, I was wondering why we gave company seats to those guys. Is there a project we're working on with them that I don't know about? Obviously not. They were in completely different industries. It would be like Coca-Cola partnering with John Deere. Jerk lets out an, uh, again, and the client immediately speaks over him, asking, Jerk, I gave you those tickets for OP. At this point, Jerk is turning bright red. He responds with, Oh, uh, well, he, he wasn't going to be able to make it, so he must have given the seats away to someone else, and turns to me, looking for me to cover for him. Client smirks at me. I respond, Uh, what are you talking about? Client, you gave me tickets to the Super Bowl? Client suddenly raises his voice, Jerk! Those tickets were a personal thank you gift to OP. Did you give them to someone else? Was it another client? Jerk butts in with an, Oh, uh, maybe something got mixed up in the office. Client went quiet for what probably seemed like an eternity to Jerk. He then looked down, grabbed his portfolio and iPad, put them into his briefcase and said, I think this meeting is over. OP, it seems as if I owe you a thank you gift. Let's go to lunch. Stephanie, you're welcome to join. Jerk, I need to evaluate our relationship. Please go back home and expect to hear from us next week. Jerk suggests he would like to join, presumably to do damage control, and Stephanie sternly tells him, I don't think that's a good idea, and asks for the front desk to see Jerk out. As soon as he's in the elevator, we all break out laughing hysterically. Stephanie wasn't really a VP, just an employee at the company who client had drafted into helping with his pre-planned meeting skit but she did end up coming to lunch with us and was a fellow Niners fan and a total blast to hang out with. On our way to the restaurant, I got a desperate text from Jerk saying I needed to cover for the firm and that we could discuss things when I got back. I replied, yes, we need to talk, but I'll see what I can do. Client told me to wait a couple hours and then respond to him. One, to expect invoices for the resale value of the Super Bowl tickets. Resale is way above face value. It was over $10,000 as well as our lunch. He picked a pricey spot and made a big show of overspending, and that he expected them to be paid immediately. 2. Expected I be given a direct apology. 3. Expected a written apology to his company for what he considered theft. And 4. He will only interact with me or another one of our firm's partners. Never jerk. This whole thing caused a stir with the other partners, and I actually came off looking great, because it appeared that I had made a good faith effort to save the client for the firm despite being the victim in the situation. The client would transfer to another partner, which meant Jerk lost his profit share on any work with them. Oh, and the other partners in the firm made Jerk pay the invoices back out of his salary. In retrospect, I really have no idea what the heck this guy was thinking. Did he seriously believe the client would just not notice me not thanking him for the Super Bowl tickets? Anyway, the well was kind of poison for me there long term because Jerk wasn't going anywhere. I left the firm a few months later for a much better position. Client ultimately terminated their relationship with that firm a year later. He actually now works with a good friend of mine at a competing firm. I'm still ticked I missed out on the Super Bowl even though we lost. Hoping we make it back this year so I can finally go to one in person. Go Niners! Am I the jerk for not supporting my wife's desire to go to medical school? I, male 35, have a wife who's 34 who stays home to take care of our two kids. I am a relatively wealthy software engineer 
and I've been trying to be financially responsible to save money for retirement and my kids' college. After getting into a few medical TV shows, my wife has had an obsession with becoming a doctor and has been trying to convince me to pay for her applications to multiple medical schools. I think this is a stupid decision because my wife has been out of her communications degree for 11 years now and she hasn't even taken the MCAT or anything like that. And if by some slim chance she gets into medical school, her tuition would wreck our finances and cause all sorts of problems with childcare. I tried explaining to her that this decision isn't realistic and suggested that she try to do some other training, like being a CNA, to get a taste for the medical field first, but she got mad at me and said that I'm stealing away her career aspirations. Am I the jerk? Edit. Here's some context for my comments. I told her I would support her taking a smaller step into the medical field by becoming a CNA or a nurse first, because it's more realistic for her to get that position and then advance to medical school. Also, I never forced her to stay at home and do childcare. I do a third of the housework on top of my job, and she asked to stay at home since we got married. She just recently changed her mind. I understand your concern. I don't overly restrict her spending, and any financial rule that we create that is imposed on her is also imposed on me. All large-scale financial decisions, over $1,000, have to be approved by both of us to occur. We both can buy necessities and do anything we want underneath $1,000 occasionally. Since her 50 applications exceed $1,000, we both needed to approve, and I don't approve at all. Edit 2. More context from relative things I addressed in comments. Additionally, my wife is refusing to take the MCAT, despite my encouragement to do so first, because she thinks studying for it will slow down her timeline. And to those who are suggesting I agree to let her apply to fewer schools, she does not like that compromise. She insists she has to maximize her chances by applying to at least 50. She also doesn't like the compromise I offered of trying another medical career first, like nursing. Not the jerk. Retired nurse here. Ask her if she would apply to nursing school. If she has her bachelor's degree, any field as long as it's a bachelor's degree, she can apply for a 16-month accelerated RN bachelor's program. She can always pursue more advanced degrees if she chooses. She'll soon see how television programs in no way ever reflect reality. There's a huge demand for nurses. But again, she will quickly realize why there's so many positions available. Am I the jerk for yelling at my brother and kicking him out of my house? I'm 28, female, and my brother, who's 33, and I have a difficult relationship, all because I started dating his best friend, 34, male, 8 years ago, and for him, that was an unforgivable betrayal. And I know that to this day, he still thinks the same. That's why our relationship is almost non-existent now. I apologize thousands of times for falling in love with his best friend and for not having been able to fall in love with someone else, but he never forgave me. We only see each other at family parties and that's it. He didn't attend our wedding and didn't want to meet our kids, who are 6, 4, and 2, when they were born either, so you can imagine how much he hates me. A few days ago, we celebrated our mom's 62nd birthday at my house because hers was being renovated. Well, my mom begged him to come because she's sick and she doesn't know if she will be able to celebrate her birthday with us next year, and he accepted her invitation and went to my house. Of course, since he arrived, he made it clear that he was only there for our mom and that he was not interested in playing happy family with me or my kids. I kept quiet because I wanted my mom to have a good day and ignore him. After cutting the cake, my mom opened her gifts, and one of those gifts was an album of the most important moments of all her kids and grandkids, something that for some reason she asked for a few months ago. And she was so happy with the album that she started looking at all of the photos and showing them to the guests while remembering when she took each photo of us, her kids. In that album, there were photos of my brother with my husband at their high school graduation. My husband was included because he and my brother have been friends since they were babies, so he's like another son to her. And when my brother saw them, he said something like, What a nice picture. No one would suspect that you would get with my little sister a few years later. My sister, 31, told him to shut up, that he was being rude, but he didn't stop and kept looking at the photos to say things that nobody wanted to hear. So I got tired and asked him to leave my house. I told him that he was being rude and inconsiderate with our mother, that I didn't want him there. And of course he stormed off, and now he thinks that the villain of the movie is me. And the worst thing is that one of our sisters, who's 36, thinks the same thing, because she thinks that I should have kept quiet since it's my fault that he's like that. Am I the jerk? Edit. I don't know if my brother wishes he was the one with my husband, 
but the truth is that I suspected it many times when I saw how affectionate he was with my husband. Like, my husband had a few girlfriends before me, and my brother hated all of them. But I thought it was just jealousy because he didn't spend as much time with him. But if I think about it, it does look weird. He's in his 30s, and he only ever had a girlfriend when he was 12 or 13. He was always possessive of my husband and overly affectionate, which my husband always hated. So maybe it's true. Maybe that's why I unconsciously apologized to him, because deep down, I knew he was in love with him too. I don't know. Edit 2. I spoke to my husband, and he says that nothing ever happened between them, that they were just friends, that he never did or said anything to make him think otherwise. So I don't know what's wrong with him. I just know that I feel an enormous guilt. If he's in love with him, I'll never be able to feel at peace again. I don't understand. You would think that if two people you loved very much decided to be together, you would be happy for them. Is it possible that your brother had closet romantic feelings for your husband, his best friend? Did your husband suddenly stop hanging out with him completely after he started dating you, so your brother feels like you stole his best friend? Is he single and just a super miserable person? You're not the jerk at all. You did nothing wrong falling in love with his best friend. You both should be treated with respect regardless of his thoughts on your relationship. My pregnant daughter is demanding to move in with me and bringing her boyfriend who doesn't even work. My daughter is 23. I'm dad, by the way. A few years ago, my wife, not her mom, took her to get a birth control implant and she was always happy on it. Fast forward about a year and she meets a guy. He's 28, online and falls in love. He lives in another state. She quickly started talking about how they both want to get married and both want to have kids. About three months before her trip to meet him in person, she told me she had gotten her implant out and switched to the pill because she doesn't like the implant anymore. This kind of raised my eyebrow. So I talked to her. We go over how important it is to take the pill properly every day and we talk about other birth control options, she said on the pill. I also went over the cost of kids and the amount of work and responsibility babies are with her. Part of my concern here is that her mother openly admits she stopped taking her pills and intentionally got pregnant so I would marry her. I did and we are divorced now. I also told her that I love my kids and raising them, but I had no interest in raising theirs. I'm enjoying retirement. I have a 10 and an 8 year old with my wife. Well, lo and behold, she gets pregnant on her trip. Boyfriend is not financially stable and is in another state and due to morning sickness, she's been missing a lot of work. She's intent on keeping the baby. She called last night and asked if she and her boyfriend could come live with me so he could move here and find a job. He doesn't have any significant work history or education and is morbidly obese, which causes him a lot of health problems, so currently he's on disability. And they would save up money and be out before the baby is born. Also note, her mom does not have room at her house. I said no. My daughter has a history of not following through on her commitments and I know that she won't actually move out before she has the baby, and probably not for a long while after. She has trouble taking responsibility for herself, and I'm guessing we'll be the ones dealing with the baby mostly. We currently have a cat she adopted and then didn't want because she wouldn't clean its box, so it went to the bathroom everywhere. On top of that, I don't want this man that I don't know and she barely knows in my home with my kids. So now he's flying up here so they can find a place together. She currently rents a room in a party house. I told her I would help her with the deposit and first month's rent, but if they wanted to go play house, I wasn't going to fund it, so don't expect me to pay when they can't. Now she's upset with me. Her mom has chewed me up one side and down the other for not supporting her. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. We really need to normalize the fact that as parents, it's your duty to ensure your kid is taken care of, no matter how old they are. Not only are you extremely judgmental of your daughter's life, but now you flat out refuse to help her in her time of need. You sound like a deadbeat dad to me, and honestly, you don't even deserve your daughter. She deserves so much better, and it's a shame you're not man enough to step up to the plate and be an actual father. I didn't even show up at my own dad's funeral because he was also a judgmental jerk that always had an opinion and couldn't keep his mouth shut. Don't be surprised when your daughter doesn't show up at yours or even make a post on social media about it. It's weird to me that a parent is trying to control and question a grown woman's decision to be on birth control. Honestly, just help as much as you can, and in a few years, you'll love your grandchild, and it'll be time for them all to be gone after some extra time to figure it out. You'll be sad, but happy it happened. Besides, you're not retired yet with the other kids at home. 
I mean, I could go either way here. Do I think I would want you as my parent? No way. Are you within your rights? Sure. Are you a good person? No comment. You're the jerk. Look, that's your daughter. Love her unconditionally like she loves you. She fell in love because she's young and bought into his love bombing. She made a mistake that will one day result in your greatest joy, a grandchild. Will you tell this grandbaby I didn't want you, so I made it harder on your mom to even keep you? You're a dad, and you don't have to agree with her choices. Your only job as a parent is to watch her fall and have her back to stand back up tall. Not the jerk. Stories like this make me so glad I never had kids. You can try as hard as you want to raise your kid to be a responsible person with a good head on their shoulders, but they can still end up being a complete jerk like your daughter. Then you're the one who's expected to take responsibility for their poor actions. The reason all these idiots are calling you the jerk is because in their own lives, they're the ones in your daughter's position. They're the ones who are losers and expecting their parents to baby them well into adulthood. I'm really sorry she turned out to be such a moron, but good luck on your other two. I hope they don't turn out to be miserable shut-ins like most of these losers here on Reddit. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his daughter? Please let us know. I hope each and every commenter who's calling him a bad dad are in the exact same position he's in one day. Actually, I don't. That would just be increasing the population of stupid people. No, you don't understand. I really would not do that if I were you. I work in a union shop and I've been a shop steward for most of my 25 plus year career. In that time, I've done some crap, both figurative and literal. And every single time I've ever been unwary enough about how fate works to utter the words, now I've seen everything, the universe will inevitably hand me its beer and say, watch this. Stewards, despite the general perception of us, aren't there to defend employees who are accused of misconduct. We're there to defend the collective bargaining agreement, meaning if you've well and truly done yourself and your future with the agency we both work for, my role is to primarily help you determine which of your options for leaving you're going to exercise. I've been at this rodeo for a long time, and management and I generally have a pretty good understanding of how things are going to go. Enter Jackie. Jackie was one of those unbelievably toxic, peaked in high school cheerleader types with just enough understanding of what our employer does, how it's required to behave within federal guidelines, and what its obligations are when you utter certain mystical phrases like, I need an accommodation, or discrimination based on a protected class. To be clear, those things are not just law, they are also morally right to be concerned about, and so my employer actually bends over backwards and does backflips to be certain that they're going above and beyond the minimum. Jackie was not a minority in any sense. She was female, but in a workplace that's 80% female. That doesn't quite count. She may well have been disabled, but that was undiagnosed, I think, and I'm inclined to think her claims of it, much like most of the rest of the things she said, were complete fabrications. The point at which I got involved was at the tail end of over a year's worth of actions by Jackie in which it rapidly became apparent that her manager was, in fact, an excellent candidate for canonization. I got referred to her when one of my other union friends contacted me and said, Hey Jackie, so and so just got put on administrative leave and it's total BS, can you help? I get referrals like this a lot, both because I've been around forever and because I have a pretty good track record for ensuring that people accused of crap they haven't actually done get treated fairly, so nothing stuck out to me as odd. I contacted her and she had absolutely no idea why management would put her on administrative leave without any warning and confiscate all of her agency issued devices, access, and instruct her that she was not to have any contact at all with anyone she worked with during work hours. This immediately sent up a whole host of red flags. For one thing, I know the senior HR guy that is the HR analyst boss who's involved, having been down the road of different situation, but this is what we can do to negotiate with him many, many times over the years. I don't always agree with him, but he's fair, and usually we can come to some sort of middle ground. At any rate, he would never suspend someone out of the blue without a really, really good reason. She knows what she's done. She has to. So I gave her my usual spiel of things to do and things you should not do. Don't tell me or our employer things that aren't true, especially if you think it'll make you look bad if you don't. Don't talk to your coworkers. Don't talk to your friends about this, particularly because you live in a town of under 2,000 people. Everyone knows everything about everyone else. Do not talk with management or HR without me present, period. 
When they do start asking questions, keep answers simple, to the point, short, and do not give lengthy explanations. Tell them what they want to know and otherwise shut up. I've been here and done this many times. I know this process very well. I can't tell you what they're going to do, but I can tell you what I think they're going to do, and I'm usually either right or pretty close to being right. I have been surprised. Nearly three weeks went by of radio silence from the agency. Other than a bland sort of, we want to talk with Jackie about utilization of work assignments, tasks, and equipment. Email that tells you almost nothing while still being literally true. Finally, it was go time for a meeting, and I did something I haven't done in a really long time. I physically drove to Jackie's work site instead of attending virtually, over an hour and a half each way. What the heck, the weather was nice. We met ahead of going in, and I asked her if she remembered the rules I gave her at the beginning. She said she did. I asked her if she had been following them, and she said she had been very careful to. Swell, in we go. During the meeting, it was almost immediately obvious to me from the questions they started asking that Jackie was in serious, serious trouble. Not like written warning or pay reduction. No, they were going to go for termination and she was probably going to be very lucky if they decided not to refer it to the DA for criminal prosecution. An abbreviated summary are just the high points. Jackie had hundreds of confidential documents and electronic files in her personal possession, many of which fall squarely under HIPAA. She had emailed these out of the government system to one of the four or five personal email addresses she maintains. Her explanation for this was questionable. Jackie had logged overtime without permission, a lot, and on one memorable date, when she was vacationing in Europe with her family at the time, she said she had called in to attend a meeting but didn't have an answer why that meeting had apparently been 11 and a half hours long and nobody remembered her attending by phone. Jackie had audio recordings of disabled and elderly people with whom she was working that she had taken without their consent or knowledge, a lot of them. Jackie's overall work product and system activity reliably showed that she was logging in at the start of her day from home and she worked some in the afternoon, but there were hours and hours of time when her computer was idle. She explained this as participating in union activity, which I knew was BS because Jackie is not a steward. Jackie has no idea what the collective bargaining agreement actually says about much of anything beyond stewards can do whatever they want and management can't say crap, which is uninformed, shall we say. At any rate, steward activity must be recorded and time-coded as such. Jackie has never attended a steward training and so didn't know this. Apparently, nobody ever told her that. There's more. There's so much more. But in the interest of brevity, I will summarize the next four months of my dealing with this woman by pointing back to the cardinal rules I gave her and simply say she broke every single one of them. A lot. When it finally got to the dismissal hearing that comes before the you're fired, get out letter, she told me going in that she wanted to run things because she had some stuff she wanted to cover that she thought I probably wouldn't be A. Comfortable doing. True, because it was irrelevant. B. Didn't know much about. Again, true, because she had invented details, story, and witnesses as participants. And C. She felt like I wasn't really on her side in this to begin with. Not quite true. She was a member, so my job is representation here. Me. I really don't think that's a good idea. I've done a lot of these. You should let me handle it. Jackie. No, I know what I'm doing, and I talked with my attorney about this a lot. You can't stop me. Me. You're right, I can't but this isn't going to go the way you think it will. Jackie, I know I'm right. They can't do this to me. Me, this isn't a good idea, but okay, it's your show. In we went and sat down. The senior HR guy I mentioned earlier was there and he gave me a funny look when I sat back, laptop closed and said nothing. Dismissal meetings are actually our meeting and we get to run them from start to finish. They're there to listen. She started talking and I have to give them credit. They took notes listened to the things she said, and kept straight faces the entire time. It went exactly as I figured it would. Just the things they had asked her about in the first of the several meetings I attended with Jackie had covered terminable offenses on at least four or five different subjects, independent of one another. At the end, when she finally wound down, they all turned to me, Jackie included, and asked if I had anything I wanted to cover or that I thought may have been missed. Nope, I said. I think she covered everything already. I don't have anything to add. That afternoon, I got the union copy of her dismissal notice. 
Generally, they're open to at least discussing the option of the worker resigning and giving them a neutral reference going forward, but that wasn't in the cards. The last I had heard of Jackie, the Department of Justice was involved with her and her husband, and I'm reasonably confident that it didn't go well for her either. I do know that she will never work for the government again, as the letter was pretty explicit about what information they would release to any government agency asking for a reference. So it goes, they followed the collective bargaining agreement, terminating her with ample just cause. Am I the jerk for refusing to help my friend take care of her baby after she kicked out her boyfriend? I, 19 female, recently got a call from my friend, Jess, who's 23, begging me to run to the shop for some baby formula and other food essentials because she was tired. I agreed. I got her some stuff and dropped it off and offered to nurse the baby so she could have a shower and cook some pasta. She was super happy and took up my offer. This was at 4.15 and her boyfriend usually gets back from work at 5.30. Jess had her shower and food and when it hits 5 p.m., I ask if she's going to be okay for half an hour until her boyfriend gets home. She tells me she kicked him out because he went to visit his mother whilst he had the baby and he hadn't asked her first. I should be clear that I don't have kids and never intend to, and so I can't pretend to know what goes through a new parent's head, but I found that whole thing so ridiculous. I said that's so stupid of her because he clearly loves her and the baby and he didn't do it to be a jerk. Jess got mad and said I don't get it. We sat in silence for a few moments before she asked me if I could help her the next day with the baby. I said no. She got really upset and asked why. I told her that she needs to beg her boyfriend to come back since the baby is both their responsibility and whilst I'll help her out every now and then, I'm not going to become a substitute parent when the baby clearly has two loving ones. She told me to leave but then texted me a few times later that day asking what days I was free the next week so she could get work done. I told her I love her but she needs to get her act together and sort it out with her boyfriend. She then went to the group chat and began asking our other friends for help and, accidentally, mention what I had said to her. Everyone thinks I'm a huge jerk and I can't help but wonder if I am. I want to be clear, Jess' only qualms are that he went to visit his parents when he had the baby and that he didn't ask her for permission first because she was asleep. She admitted he's a great father who works hard to provide for the family. He's not a disinterested bum or whatnot. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Not for saying no, but why you said no. She just had a whole baby. You admit you have no parental instinct, so that extends to parental fear of something happening to your baby. You should never assume you know what's happening behind closed doors. She's allowed to have boundaries. You don't know what conversation she's had with her boyfriend about their in-laws. It's not your place to judge her. Not the jerk for not wanting to take care of someone else's kid, but you should probably have been a lot less judgmental when she told you she kicked her boyfriend out and telling her she needs to get him to come back was definitely way out of line. Her relationship, or lack thereof, is really none of your concern, and for all you know, maybe they had major issues behind closed doors. You're the jerk. You're not an actual friend, so stop calling yourself that. Real friends are there for their friends when they need them. Real friends don't abandon others in their time of need. If you cared about her, even just a bit, then you'd have no problem helping with the baby. You expect her to stay with a guy she's clearly not happy with? What kind of a sociopath are you? It's 2023 and we in no way, shape, or form have to stay with guys we aren't happy with. People complain about how high divorce rate is now. Well, guess what? It's because we stopped settling for guys that suck and don't treat us right. Guys get mad when we say things like, where have all the good guys gone? But the truth is that there just aren't any more of them. All the hot guys will just hook up with us whenever they want to but the ones who will settle down with us are just average looking or usually worse. Nobody wants to be stuck with an average looking guy who probably doesn't even make much money. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. These stories really make me never want to have kids. No one ever makes it hot enough? Okay then, you asked for it. I used to be a chef in a Mexican restaurant in a small town in Australia nearly 40 years ago. We were modestly popular and I loved working there. One night, a young man came in to dine with a young lady. It was very obviously a first date. They ordered a nachos to share with a side of jalapenos for their entree, and he ordered a steak Veracruz, hot, for his main, and the young lady ordered a chicken burrito, mild, for hers. I, as I usually did throughout the night, would walk around the tables and ask if people were enjoying the food. 
After the nachos, I checked on them and the young man informed me that the chili that accompanied the nachos were not hot at all and that he loved hot food. I was informed that he had traveled extensively and had eaten some of the hottest foods in the world and that no one had ever made a dish too hot for him. He reiterated that he wanted his steak main extra hot. To be honest, I found him to be pompous and rather obnoxious in the way he was speaking down to me and found myself taking a disliking to him. I will add at this point that the young lady was looking a little uncomfortable and I got the impression her date was not going as she had expected. I headed to the kitchen. I made her a lovely chicken burrito while putting together his steak. He wanted it hot. He was going to get it. Our steak Veracruz was usually a steak cooked and topped with our house tomato sauce base with some bell peppers and onions with a touch of chili. On this occasion, I set to work. Keep in mind, this was Australia back in the 80s and we did not get a lot of different chilies back then and a jalapeno was considered hot by most Aussie pellets. Hey, we were an uneducated bunch. I had a few bird's eye chilies in the kitchen that were mainly there for the staff and the resident Mexican guitarist meals, so I started with those. I finally diced about 10 of those with their seeds. I then threw in the chilies and then I added about a tablespoon of chili powder and about a tablespoon of cayenne. I soon felt the fumes hit my nose and the back of my throat and my eyes started watering. I ran to the door of the kitchen to get a breath of breathable air as the air in my tiny kitchen was rapidly becoming unbreathable. I ran back to my pan and put a ladle of the house tomato sauce in. I then let that simmer for a few minutes. I then added some chopped up jalapenos from a jar in my fridge and thought, why not? And in went a bit more chili powder. I then put the flash fried steak in to finish it off in the sauce. I served it all up on a plate with some rice, served up the chicken burrito and hit the bell for the waitress to serve it to the table. The waitress came back and told me that as she placed it in front of him, he said, this had better be hot. She assured him the chef had done as he requested. I went to the door of the kitchen, joined by my waitress to watch the show unfold and unfold it did. I watched with glee as he sliced the steak, took a piece of his fork and with a smug look on his face, he put it in his mouth. He took a chew and then realized his mistake. I saw it. That moment when his face changed, but he was trying so hard not to show it. He couldn't. He was on a date and he had bragged so hard and now he had to go through with it. He ate the steak. I could see every ounce of pain on his face. He struggled. He struggled hard. His date watched him with a slight smile on her lips, and I got the impression that she was thoroughly enjoying his pain. He went through several jugs of water. He sweated. He barely spoke. He looked really uncomfortable. At the end of the meal, I came out of the kitchen and asked him if he had enjoyed his meal. His words? Could have been hotter. He never came back. His date? She became a regular and told us he was an insufferable fool and she never saw him again. I have no regrets other than I wish Carolina Reapers had been around back then. No, I said okay. A few years ago, I was moving my business to a new location that needed six months to be built out. I informed our current alarm company a few months before the move that we'd be moving services, which for whatever reason they couldn't do. I had to open a new site on the account and then I could close the old when after the move. Sure, that's fine. They got all the details and sold me the newer system that would be connected to the internet so I could monitor it from my phone. Sounds great. So they told me that they could install it next week, but I had to have the internet set up and running before they could do it. I informed them the phone lines and internet would not be installed until later as I didn't want to pay for services we were not using and I would let them know when that was installed so that they could come out for their install. Everything satisfied, the call was complete. A few days later, I started getting weekly phone calls from their installers, telling me that they were on their way to the new site to do the install, to which I had to go through the explanation of the internet won't be installed until later and that I would call them and let them know when that was done. Each time they said, oh, okay, sounds good, we'll wait to hear from you. But then the following week, it would repeat again. On the sixth week, I got the same weekly call from the alarm company installer. Hi, this is Jim. Just letting you know we'll be at your site in about 30 minutes to do the install. So this time I said, okay. We hung up and I went back to work, which was happening at our current location. No workers or work was happening at the new site on this day. About 30 minutes later, I got a call from Jim saying the doors are locked and nobody's answering. I said, I know. Nobody's there today and the internet won't be installed until next month anyway. 
At this point, he starts getting agitated with me and asked why I scheduled an install for today and why I told him I'd be there when he called. I explained, I didn't. You said you'd be there in 30 minutes. I said, okay. Amazingly, the call stopped and I called them a couple weeks before the move and they came out and installed just fine. Wanted to answer a few questions asked in the comments as I tried to keep the story concise so it didn't drag on. Yes, the company was ADT. The contract didn't start until they did the install and install was free, so I wasn't paying for the install. Yes, I did call ADT customer service after the first installer called, saying that they were on their way. That did not help. Besides letting the installer come out, I was never rude to or angry with them since I knew it wasn't their fault, and I explained the situation just like I had done the first five times. They just got caught up in the game. And I need to give credit to my uncle for this solution, as this was applied learning. He did something very similar to his sister a long time ago, and this story became a legend in my family. I've used it many times. Am I the jerk for getting my son's ex better food than him? My son lives with me, which is fine. He's 35, but I have a big house, and I appreciate the company and occasional help around the house. Previously, he lived with his ex-girlfriend, Kira, who he had two kids with. I love my grandsons and was very blessed that even from pregnancy that Kira let me be very involved as her mother had passed when she was very young and she doesn't have much family as she bounced around the foster system. Early on, even before the kids, we became close and I viewed her as a daughter which my son encouraged. Last year while Kira was pregnant with their second, they split up. My son blames Kira but I know from living with him and being a close support that it is at best 50-50. Once they split, my son decided he didn't want anything to do with Kira or the kids and his previously encouraged and embraced view of our friendship turned and he wanted me to have nothing to do with Kira or the kids. I told him no. I was going to continue to be a big part of my grandkids and Kira's life. This has caused some friction, but we mostly operate on a don't ask, don't tell. Once a week, I go to Kira's to see the kids, usually after I go grocery shopping. My son always gives me a list of what he wants and then I get that plus what I want and what I use to cook for us during the week. I do all the cooking for me and my son, but he often doesn't eat my food and opts for the ready-made stuff he asks me to get him instead if that matters, and I always ask Kira if she needs anything. She usually says no, but I still always bring some fruits and veggies. She likes the same food I do, so I also will sometimes bring her part of what I get for myself if I know it's too much for me to eat during the week. An example is salmon. My son hates fish, but Kira and the kids love it, so I'll get a big one and portion it at Kira's and then bring home what I will eat for myself. Friday, my son saw the receipt from the groceries and was irate at how much the salmon cost for the amount I got. I told him the truth, that I gave two-thirds of the salmon to Kira. He blew up and demanded I stop buying her groceries, or if I continue, he wants the same amount spent on him. The thing is, I get him everything he asks for. It's just that a box of pizza pops is less money than salmon. I also tend to get organic produce for myself and Kira and the boys, but my son refuses to eat certain things if they are organic. It doesn't make sense to me, but he said I'm a jerk and read me a post from here about another mom who gave better food to one kid over another, so I thought maybe I would post. Update. Many of you have pointed out that I'm enabling my son. I didn't think I was because I've been very clear how I feel about him not being there for the boys, but actions are as important as words. I will not stop being in Kira and the boys' lives ever, and in fact, I will probably increase the amount of time and resources I give to them. I also want to just state in no uncertain terms, as I have had a couple messages and comments about it, Kira was never unfaithful. Her only crime was being unwilling to forgive my son for some actions unless he went to therapy, which he did not do and rightfully informing HR at his former workplace of something relevant. OMG, not the jerk. Your son is totally taking advantage of you and has no say whatsoever as to how you spend your money or time. I think it's time he finds his own place and takes responsibility for himself and the kids. Not the jerk for buying her groceries, not the jerk for helping Kira out, and not the jerk for remaining in her and your grandkids' lives, not the jerk for supporting her and her family. I'm sure she needs it. However, your son is the biggest and worst type of jerk there is. He's a classic deadbeat, dropping his kids regardless of who the blame is on. He's also a jerk for living in his mommy's basement, having mommy buy his groceries and getting mad that mommy is taking care of his kids. 
Finally, you're the jerk for supporting this deadbeat behavior. Shame on you. Housing Association wants me to pay my late aunt's debt? No, pay me the money I overpaid instead. Before I lived in my current place, I was living with my aunt. She was the main tenant who sorted the bills and I would pay her a lump sum each month as board payments. In early 2021, she passed unexpectedly. Naturally, I didn't want to continue living in this place. Bad memories and bearing the responsibility for an entire place alone wasn't feasible for me financially at the time. After speaking with the housing association, I was informed the only way to end the tenancy would be by getting the tenancy agreement moved over into my name before terminating the tenancy when I was ready to move out. What I didn't know at this point was that my aunt was in arrears on the rent payments. When it came to the point of leaving the tenancy, I had money in savings and just settled up the rent entirely, paying 500 pounds of my aunt's arrears on top of the rent I personally owed from living there alone. I then stayed at the place for a few more weeks before closing the tenancy. In hindsight, I probably should have queried the payment, but at that point, I just wanted to get rid of the place. After moving into my new place, I was getting pestered by the housing association who said I still owed 300 pounds on the previous house. There was a lot of back and forth before I then asked for a copy of the rent statement. It was around this time that I was speaking to people about this money I supposedly owed. I was informed that I, probably, shouldn't be liable for my aunt's debt as I didn't receive the estate and was not the next of kin. However, there was also an argument to be made that I was liable for the debt as technically my name was on the agreement and I became the main tenant. With this information in mind, I looked at the rent statement, worked out how much money I owed from the first week after my aunt had passed and deducted it from my total rent payments made after that point. It turned out I had paid 200 pounds extra, assuming I wasn't liable for the debt. I presented all my working out in a thorough email and sent it over. I didn't hear anything back from them after that conveniently and assumed it was all over. I decided not to pursue this as I was sick of being pestered by them and I wasn't 100% sure if I was or wasn't liable for this money. Fast forward nearly two years. I received a letter last month just before Christmas stating that I still owed this 300 pounds and that it would be sent to debt collectors if nothing was done. At this point, I was upset. I spoke to someone who was able to tell me for sure that I'm not liable for the debt in this particular situation, so I sent a firmly written email detailing how I don't owe this money, but in fact, they owed me, provided all of the evidence and threatened small claims if the situation wasn't rectified soon. It took weeks of me pestering them via phone calls and emails for me to get in contact with a lovely woman who apologized on behalf of the company on how I was treated. She then got the ball rolling and eventually my 200 pound refund cleared the other day. This was a particularly satisfying end because if they would have just left it, I wouldn't have chased it up and they would be 200 pounds better off. What a shame. Parents told my brother that he could take my house and I could just live in the camper in the backyard. I'm a single man in my early 30s. I've got a brother who's 29 and he's already got four kids now. He had his first at 22 and his second followed a year later. Then the third two years after that and the fourth is the most recently born a couple months ago. His wife, my sister-in-law, and I do not get along as she always likes to try and get a rise out of me by acting superior, then turns into an extreme self-victimizing drama queen if I retaliate against her in any way. She can cry in an instant and can put on an extremely convincing show to get sympathy from just about anyone. My parents and brother absolutely adore her even though they know exactly how she really is and just don't care. She's very good looking, I'll give her that, but she's so awful that I could never be attracted to her. She also refuses to get any sort of job even though she has a college degree and my mother willingly helps with the kids all day. So their finances are entirely dependent on my brother. This also means they can't afford to live anywhere but my parents' house and privacy is a bit of an issue with all of them under one roof in a three-bedroom house that was built in the 60s. Growing up, my younger brother was also the obvious favorite. We're three years apart in age but he developed a superiority complex because I was badly punished if I retaliated against his antics in any way. It was obvious my parents cared for him a lot more because he got the lion's share of everything unless people called them out on it, which did happen a fair bit by other members of family, which is why my parents packed us all up and moved us about 150 miles away from them, so they generally would only see us on holidays since it was a three-hour drive. My parents mistreated me on a number of occasions, 
flirted relentlessly with my first girlfriend to the point that she broke up with me and laughed at any misfortune I had, and my parents just told me to suck it up whenever I was upset about it. I only got equal treatment when my parents wanted to keep up appearances. I admit it was rather funny to see the looks on their faces whenever they had to treat me equal to my brother on birthdays and Christmas because other people were present. We had relatives that were very nosy and loved gossiping drama, so my parents did their best to hide what was really going on and threatened to take all my stuff away if I didn't keep my mouth shut. If anything, it just made my parents celebrate more when I turned 18 and moved out because it meant they no longer had to provide for me. I wasn't even done with high school yet when I moved out, but couch surfing was far better than living with them. I was low contact ever since leaving home. They didn't even show up for my high school graduation, but I really don't care. From that point on, I would usually only see my parents and my brother on holidays like the rest of the family. The start of 2020 lockdown was not kind to me. I lost my job and couldn't renew the lease on my condo because my roommate also lost his job and neither of us could really afford the place on unemployment money. It was a rented two-bedroom condo that I really loved. As the lease was ending, my roommate left early to move back in with relatives and I had to sell nearly all of my stuff because I was soon going to be homeless if I didn't downsize to an extreme. I really shouldn't have rented a place that was so expensive, but I liked living the high life, until that life wasn't kind to me, and I realized I should have been living somewhere far cheaper so I could have saved more money to fall back on. But I had a plan. I own a truck simply for the fact that I've always loved trucks, so I found a $1,000 camper in good shape and put it on my truck just so I could live out of it for a while. It was supposed to be temporary, but I ended up living out of it far longer than I ever thought. I originally was hoping to be able to live out of the camper at my parents' house where my brother and his family still reside as well. But when I asked my parents to let me stay for a while, they told me they had a full house and didn't want me there. Plus, we hadn't exactly gotten along in the past decade. They said they'd only agree to let me park my camper there if I paid them basically what it would cost to rent an apartment in my area. That was way too much just to park my camper. I was jobless and trying to save as much of my unemployment money as I could until I found a new job. I may as well be living in an apartment with the rent price they were asking. My parents called my camper an eyesore and told me to take a hike since we couldn't come to an agreement. And sister-in-law thought it was absolutely hilarious I had to live in a camper. My brother joined her in pointing at and mocking me while calling me a homeless bum. I parked my truck and camper in a store parking lot to sleep on the first night that I had nowhere else to go. I felt scared out of my mind that someone might try to break in. Suffice to say, I didn't sleep well that night. There was nowhere else I could go as any other relatives that owned houses were fairly far away and all of my friends were all apartment people and I was pretty attached to my area as well, so I didn't want to just leave. I'd also had my mail forwarded to a friend's apartment. It was the only way I could still get my mail anymore. Finding a stable place to park was pretty difficult. I went looking around to try and find a job similar to my old one. It took months of living the nomadic camper life. In that time, I had to deal with a lot. Everything from beggars and addicts to people demanding I leave because my camper was an eyesore. At one point, someone who told me to move claimed to be with an HOA. I wasn't even parked on a street with houses. And when I questioned, what HOA? They got incredibly belligerent and threatened me. I moved my camper anyway just to avoid the trouble. In order to have a steady supply of electricity, I learned to use a long extension cord to plug it in anywhere I could to recharge my camper batteries. This meant sneaking around and plugging it into an outside outlet of a random building while parked on a street. I know that's a crummy thing to do, but I had to keep my batteries charged so my refrigerator would stay cold. I had a small solar power bank for recharging my phone, but I didn't have anything like a generator, and generators are noisy and require fuel anyway, so I did what I had to do. After months of living like that, I finally managed to get a new job. I had to move to the neighboring city to find a job that didn't involve retail. I worked retail while in college and promised myself never again, though I was nearly ready to break that promise. I was still getting unemployment money, but I had no stable place to live while receiving it, and I didn't want to still be jobless when it ran out. Plus, I was bored out of my mind. I had little else to do but read, watch movies on a small portable DVD player, use my phone or laptop, and keep note of where I could park and what local public bathrooms I could use. I kind of envy that the Japanese have public bathhouses. We could really use stuff like that over here. When I finally landed a new job, 
I practically lived in the back lot of the building by the warehouse and old employee parking spaces that literally no one else seemed to bother using because they were so far in the back that the area was borderline forgotten. My boss and company owner actually liked this arrangement because I was willingly available to take any shift I could get, so long as I had enough sleep. He even let me take the camper off my truck and set it up in one of the spaces so I could drive around without it. Not exactly sure if this was legal, but no one bothered us about it. The entire time I lived back there, I didn't have to deal with many trespassers. There were a few, but the security guards escorted them out. I was pretty much on call almost all the time when they needed me and was working virtually every day of the week. My boss let me plug my camper into the building for power and water and I paid a small amount of rent by working for free on Sundays when no one else was in the office but the janitor and security guard. Beyond that, I usually had to shower at a friend's apartment or at my local gym as the camper didn't have a shower in it and only a portable toilet. And I didn't want to fill it because emptying it is a nasty chore, so I used other bathrooms as often as I could. I had a key to the warehouse and could go in to use the bathroom there at any hour. I was even on a first name basis with the night security guard. He's since become one of my closest friends. The camper was easy to heat in the winter with a small electric heater. Summers were not fun though. The camper didn't have AC, so I had to get a used portable air conditioner just to make it bearable. I made a lot of overtime pay and hands-on learned some new skills from other employees. Eventually, midway into this year, I landed a better position in the company as a supervisor and started making a better salary than my old job. That's when I decided I wanted a house. The scare I'd gotten from losing my condo made me realize I needed something much more stable for the long term. I looked around for something close to my work and just two miles away found a three-bedroom manufactured home on a small property, but I managed to get it for $10,000 less than the asking price somehow. I used nearly my entire savings for a down payment and got approved for a home loan. I finally didn't have to live in a camper anymore. There was enough space for me to back my truck in behind the house to take the camper off of it to set it up in the backyard. So I put it there as its own little building just in case I want to use it again. When I was fully settled in the house, I was dumb enough to brag about it on the Book of Faces. My family saw the post and that's where this crap really starts. After a few weeks, my parents and brother, along with his family, come to visit completely unannounced to have a tour of my home. I didn't even give them my address, so how they found out where I live, I still don't know. None of my friends have fessed up, and no prior family members visited me before that, so I wonder if they stalked me at work and followed me home or something. It really wouldn't surprise me. Once I opened the door, they practically all shoved their way in like rambunctious tourists. Then they just started making themselves at home. They all kept poking around and sister-in-law had this creepy smirk that she was repeatedly showing me. And it was only later that I figured out why and it made me madder than a bull that just got stung by a hornet. My parents were constantly talking about how I've got so much extra space now and it's too much for someone like me who has no wife or kids. Sure, not now, but maybe someday. And my brother kept remarking about how there was more space here than at our parents' house and how my house was closer to his job too. Red flags all around, I know. Eventually, my brother asked me to speak privately. Everyone else suddenly left the room and piled out onto the front porch. That's what finally made me realize they had planned something. My brother, let's call him Dan for the sake of simplicity, said the house was too much for me alone and I should let him move in with his family because his wife is pregnant with kid number four and my house is much closer to his job. He pointed out that I already have the camper, so I could just live in that outside while they live in the main house. And I'd like to point out that Dan never once spoke of offering rent. Mind you, he's got a good job. He also started talking about how there would be changes and even curfews, and that I couldn't just walk in at any time without prior notice. If it weren't my brother, I'd think the person I was talking to had lost their mind. But Dan lost his marbles long ago, thanks to our parents treating him like he was the center of the world. I tried to speak, but he kept talking over me as if I had no say in the matter. There was no way on earth I'd rent my house or parts of my house to him. Other people, maybe, just so that I can pay the mortgage off more easily, but certainly not him or his nasty wife. I've heard of this exact kind of situation on videos online many times and never once did I think I'd actually live it because I thought it was so ludicrous. But my parents, brother, and sister-in-law do all fit the bill for a bunch of narcissistic entitled crazies. 
so I picked up my phone and set off to start recording, then just held on to it. Dan didn't even seem to care or notice that I'd done this and just sat there with his arms waving around while talking about all the reasons of why he needed my house. Then went from saying that to acting like it was a done deal and trying to reach out his hand to shake mine. That's when I finally showed my backbone and said, Oh no! And I said it loud enough that Dan stumbled backwards for a second. I'd rarely ever raised my voice to him on that level because I was punished by our parents whenever I did. But this was my house, not theirs. My spine can be as shiny as it wants here. I stood up and then told him that my house was not up for grabs and acting like I'll let him move in just because they want it won't make it happen. I bought my house for me and it's not my fault he keeps having more kids and has to keep living with our parents because he can't afford to move out. Dan got as physically close to me as he could without actually touching me and said that I didn't deserve the house and he needed a better place for his family to live. I laughed back in his face and said that was total BS because I worked hard to be able to buy my house. Of course I deserved it. Dan started yelling that I have no wife or kids and I don't need all the space, so I may as well just give it to him. I said I'm not giving him anything and he never even offered to pay me rent. If I let him move in, I'd still be covering the entire mortgage on my own house without even being able to live in my own house. Then Dan told me that he shouldn't have to pay rent because his family comes first and our parents said I was going to do this and that I will. I yelled, as if their word was law or something, and told Dan that they did not have the right or power to give my house to him. Then right on cue, my parents and sister-in-law barged back in through the front door and surrounded me to try and force me to argue. There was a lot of fighting, but to sum it up from this point on, I heard the line, just do it for Dan, way more times than I can remember. In the fight, I told them all that they don't have a say in my life or my house and to get out before I call the cops. Sister-in-law screamed the loudest at me about how she was pregnant again and I can't do this to her. I said I did nothing to her. She just assumed she could take and take from me like I would allow it. I had no obligation to her or my family. Then I called her a stuck-up jerk who never had any respect for me, so I don't care what she thinks or how many kids she has. I have no sympathy for her. She won't be living in my house. Well, that made her angry enough to attack me. She got in one good hit, but then my brother held her back while she was kicking and screaming. She demanded he let her go so she could get me again. The phone I was holding recorded pretty much everything, so I held it up and said I was going to call the police if they didn't leave right away. My parents told Dan they were leaving. Then my mother said that I had a week to come to my senses. I told her I won't be and to not come back. Then I told sister-in-law that my phone recorded everything and if she tries anything, I'll press charges for assault. She screamed at me and then stormed out loudly crying with her face in her hands. My mother was the last one out the door and said that I better do this for Dan and sister-in-law. I responded by telling her I won't be. Am I the jerk for missing an actual emergency because I turned off my phone to avoid my wife's unnecessary contact attempts? My best friend, 31 male, and I, 27 male, have a tradition of taking a yearly weekend trip together that's phone free. We've been doing this for a decade now. These weekend trips consist of us staying in a suite and exploring the city, not traversing the wilderness so it's not like we're completely disconnected. Still, we like to keep one on hand for navigation and emergency purposes and it would usually be friend's phone that we brought along. Friend and I left for our trip this year two Fridays ago to make use of the long weekend. This was the first time I've gone on one of these trips since my wife and I moved in together, got engaged or got married. However, we were dating for the last two years worth of trips, 2021 and 2022, and she seemed fine during that time. I would just tell her I was going to be busy for the weekend and she'd leave me alone. I understand that there are different expectations once you get married, but I didn't expect for the 180 in behavior. My wife all but demanded I take my phone as well in case she needed to get a hold of me despite her having my friend's number. I let her know I had arrived and immediately after that she was texting me and asking me how things were, then again asking me another question when I didn't respond to the first one. I eventually muted our text conversation because I was sick of the phone buzzing. She called me a few hours later and asked why I wasn't responding to her texts. I reiterated that this was supposed to be a no phone weekend and kept the call short despite her trying to drag out the conversation. 
She called me once more after this. When I answered and found out it wasn't an emergency, I simply turned off my phone. The calls then started coming in from my friend and he followed suit. We spent the rest of the weekend with our phones off until the drive back on Monday. I called my wife and informed her that we were about 30 minutes away from my place and she was furious. She said that there ended up being an emergency. Her sister got into a car accident that won't affect her long term but still resulted in broken bones and that I had just ignored her the entire time when she needed me. I told her that I was very sorry to hear about her sister but it wasn't my fault she had essentially forced my hand into cutting off means of communication. She went to stay with a friend before I arrived home that night and has since come home, but she's still fuming. Am I the jerk? Edit. I'm politely asking everyone to stop making harmful accusations about my friend and the nature of our relationship when we were younger. It's making me uncomfortable and not in the I'm having an epiphany way that you guys are hoping, but in the, you're jumping to incredibly crude conclusions about someone I love and trust based on a tiny snippet into our life. Edit 2. Thank you for the kind messages. I just checked them expecting more anger, but instead I found lots of compassion. I appreciate that so much. Not the jerk. Her sister getting into what sounds like a relatively minor accident is not an emergency. This is beyond ridiculous. How is it different from you being in another country and having no service or something? People are allowed to still live their lives despite being married. You're not tethered to your spouse. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for forbidding my sister to meet my kid and telling my wife to butt out of the situation? So I, 28 male, have been married to my wife for four years and we have a two-year-old son together. My older sister, Ariel, has two kids with her husband. She's my only sibling, but we do not speak and haven't since my wedding four years ago. My wife knew I had no relationship with my sister or mother whenever we got together, but now it's causing an argument. We were a pretty typical family until my mom cheated my senior year of high school with a coworker. My dad moved out immediately and I moved with him. This caused the rift between me and my sister. My sister believed since my mom was sorry and it was a one-time thing, as she claimed, which I don't for a second believe, and was trying to reconcile through the church that me and my dad's refusal to speak with her was somehow wrong. I was 18 and my sister was 20. Long story, but eventually my sister stopped speaking with my dad. I haven't seen my mom since 2016 and we have only spoken once since in 2019 when she tried to invite herself to my wedding. She was not invited, but my sister was out of courtesy. My sister didn't show up and we have not spoken since. My wife knew when she married me that my only family was my dad and my cousins. She said it was okay and she didn't care. So a few months ago, my wife got a call from my sister's husband. I've never met him and he said that he wanted to start mending the bridge and would like to have me come meet their kids. I said no. Well, then my sister started sending pics of her kids to my wife and my wife sent pictures back. I told her multiple times I do not like this and she told me she could send pics to whoever she wants. I said that if she keeps testing my boundaries, she will be a single parent really soon. That she signed up for me as is. My wife is saying it's wrong to deprive my son of his family. I said I don't even have a relationship with my sister or brother-in-law, so why should my kid? That doesn't make me feel comfortable at all, and I don't even know these people. Also, any pic she sends could easily be forwarded to my mom, and she needed to think about that. She said she doesn't even understand why my mom can't meet her kid and that comment alone ticked me off because I've explained my whole family drama for years and it feels like she just ignored it. I said she really needs to think about who she wants to appease because I'm not going to stand for disrespect of my boundaries. My dad totally agrees with me and is telling me I should start setting aside money now for an exit strategy because my wife's behavior is exactly how my mom used to act and I should see the warning signs now. Am I the jerk? This is definitely above Reddit's pay grade. You need to seek out therapy for your parents' divorce and couples counseling for you and your wife. My completely uneducated opinion is that it seems like your father weaponized your emotions against your mother and he's using those same emotions to drive a wedge between you and your wife. She crossed a line, but your father should stay out of it. You're now issuing relationship-ending ultimatums over a couple of pictures. She's not blameless either. You guys need to seek some help to process this. Going no contact with your mother over her infidelity seems way too harsh. But again, therapy. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for telling my sister to remove me from her wedding? My twin sister, a textbook narcissist, is getting married in May 2024. I was supposed to be the maid of honor, but she would constantly hold it over my head, telling me I'm going to be demoted or removed. She asks me for my opinion, and being the person I am, I give her an honest answer, and she always blows up, deflects, and blames everything on me. When she starts yelling, I stop talking and do something else, because, well, I don't like getting yelled at and don't want to say something that will just make her yell even more. Today at lunch, we were discussing wedding plans, and I simply asked whether the maid of honor will be wearing a different dress just to get a better idea of her vision. She started yelling, saying I was making everything about me by assuming I was still the maid of honor. We moved on to overnight guests and where they'd sleep. It's a four-house camp, so there's cabins and fishing areas. My mom said she was going to rent an Airbnb because she didn't want to stay in an unfinished cabin. I made a joke that they could camp in the pop-up tent or their truck because they do that almost every weekend. My sister completely lost it, saying she had had this conversation with her fiancé already and how my mom isn't going to want to do that the night before a wedding. How was I supposed to know they had had this conversation multiple times already? She kept yelling, I shut down, then she went on about how I'm being negative, having an attitude, and she's not going to deal with her maid of honor acting like this at her wedding or bachelorette party, and any other reason she could think to yell at me. I'm not upset or mad at this point, I just want to move on to something else, but now I'm getting yelled at for always starting fights when we talk about wedding planning. She decides it's time to go, so we can head back to her apartment and I can go home. We make it out to the car and sit in the parking lot, so she can yell at me for another 10 minutes about the same stuff. I wanted nothing more than to just leave the situation, but my car was 20 minutes away, so I couldn't. We get back to her apartment, I gather my things to leave, and she's still yelling, how I apparently don't care about her or want her in my life, because I never tell her anything, and asked if I was going to even have her in my wedding. I'm also engaged. She was livid when I told her no, because I was planning on eloping to a different country, but that she was welcome to buy a plane ticket if she wanted to come. Then I walked out. I texted her saying to completely remove me from her wedding, that she clearly does not want me in it if she's so quick to tell me that I'm out every other day. If she wants to blame someone for ruining her wedding day, she should have to find someone else, because I'm not going to let it be me. Not the jerk. Based on what you've said, she is, at a minimum, being a bridezilla jerk. But just a thought experiment. Let's assume for a moment that you are actually exaggerating. Your sister is not really a narcissist. The reality is that you two just don't get along very well, and she's having a stressful time planning the wedding. It's stressful at the best of times, I know from experience. Even in that case, you're still not the jerk. You have no obligation to be your sister's maid of honor, or to attend her wedding, or to have any relationship with her at all. Your sister is entitled to her feelings of being hurt, but you are entitled to control the level of contact and involvement you want with her. Not the jerk. I think this is beyond wedding stress. OP info. Is this brand new behavior or has your sister always taken out her frustrations on you or somebody else in the family? Very rarely can you get somebody to have an epiphany and see your side of a story. And I'm only making an assumption based on the information here that whenever your sister is frustrated, stressed, or perceives that something's wrong, she totally attacks you and goes off instead of maturely addressing whatever the true issue is. If this is the case, you have to separate behavior from the person and decide what you can and cannot tolerate. I think it's wonderful that you walked away, and I'm not sure how that impacts your relationship with your parents or others in the family, and you need to be prepared for backlash from them. Your sister is most likely going to tell them some convoluted version of what actually happened. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter it's okay to use her mother for money? So I used to be married to Judy, 36 female, and we have a daughter, Scarlett, who's 13 together. Fake names. Judy never wanted kids, but I did, and I assumed she did too. We had her, and Judy completely changed. She wasn't caring towards Scarlett. They didn't bond, and she blamed Scarlett for us losing our independence. About a year after, we had a divorce, and she gave me everything. It did hurt me that she didn't even want to see Scarlett once a year even. She moved to Seattle months later, started running a business, got really fit. Her cousin told me she even got laser surgery to remove the stretch marks. Since then, Judy has moved to LA and divides her time between there, London, Mumbai, and New York City. She has become a fairly famous influencer and socialite. 
I check her Instagram every now and then and she's been at parties with celebrities all over the world and truly seems happy. To her credit, every time her financial situation changed, she would come back and get our child support agreement changed to give more to Scarlett. Every time she had come, she would spend time with Scarlett. She even kept it at the same, even though my new wife makes a lot more money than both of us and we don't need it now. About three years ago, she started calling more to talk to Scarlett. She would also come over more and every spring break, she comes for those two weeks. She phones every night unless she's in London, Mumbai, or New York City, in which case she just sends a text. On New Year's, she was at some celebrity's party, but still took the time to phone. Now, I'm not saying this makes up for anything, but she has been a presence in Scarlett's life. Well, we just found out that Judy's grandfather is very ill and he's going to pass within a month, maybe early March at best. So, she's going to India for spring break for his funeral and has requested to take Scarlett with her. I'm fine with that. My wife is fine with that. However, Scarlett got really upset at the idea of spending two weeks in India. I pointed out her mom will take her to all the nice places. She'll get to see great things, meet that part of her family. But she said that it's not fair. So I pointed out that at the very least, she can get whatever she wants out of her mom in those two weeks. My wife overheard and said I was being a jerk for telling Scarlett that it's all right for her to use her mom for cash since she's barely been in her life. I pointed out I didn't say that, but we argued, and since then, I realized what I said kind of did amount to that. Was I the jerk? Edit. Judy never told me she didn't want to have kids. She allowed me to believe that she did. If I knew she didn't, we wouldn't have gotten married. You're the jerk. If Scarlett doesn't want to go, don't make her go. Advocating for taking advantage of her mother is crappy. You managed to land not one, but two decent women. I cannot for the life of me understand how. Ah, Reddit, the perfect place to go to find people who will rip a man to shreds in the morning because he was broken by the fact that his daughter didn't want him to walk her down the aisle and then refer to a woman who abandoned her kid as a decent woman. She abandoned her but has always been paying and using her pay in accordance of her income. More than most deadbeat dads. Edit, I grew up with a deadbeat dad. No financial help from my mom or real involvement in my life. So I worded that a bit harsh. So think deadbeat parent. Am I the jerk for waking up my roommate at 7 a.m. and yelling at her? I, 20 female, woke up my roommate, who's also 20 female. Let's call her roommate at 7 a.m. and yelled at her because she left our front door unlocked and cracked open. I posted on this sub before about would I be the jerk for talking to her about leaving the door open to our apartment, unlocked and other issues, and based on what you guys said, I decided to. She seemed pretty receptive to it, but since then, her habit of forgetting it hasn't changed. I have a lot of issues with sleep, and last night I wasn't able to get any, so I went downstairs to grab an energy drink at around 7. The first thing I noticed was that there was a light coming from our front door, and as I came closer, I realized it was unlocked and partially open. The first thing that came to my mind was that there was a break-in, and I panicked and woke up my roommate because I thought we had been robbed or something. I told her that our door wasn't closed all the way and was freaking out pretty badly. Then she said, Oh, that's most likely my fault. I got delivery pretty late and probably forgot to close the door. The way she was so nonchalant really upset me and I was already exhausted, so I rounded on her and yelled, What's wrong with you? I thought I asked you to be more careful about this. We've been living in this flat for five months now and you still can't remember to shut the door properly? Are you a kid? Should I tape a sign to the door that reminds you how to close it? I didn't let her say anything after my rant and just went to my bedroom, but I felt bad about it later. I did apologize to her already and we went grocery shopping together and everything seems okay between us, but I still feel like a jerk. So, am I the jerk? Edit. I can't change the title. Sorry, it's kind of misleading. I'd get a door alarm, but I'm not even allowed to install my own curtains in this apartment, so I'm a bit done over in that regard. I grabbed an energy drink because I had a 9 a.m. class that I didn't end up going to because I was so upset. And on top of the basic security concerns, someone got attacked in the apartment complex like a block away from ours, so I've been more paranoid than usual. Edit 2. When our lease ends, I'm moving in with a different friend, so hopefully we don't have any more major incidents until then. Edit 3. My roommate has diagnosed ADD, but doesn't take her meds for it, and I'm not in a position to nag her about it. Not the jerk. 
I couldn't live with someone who was so nonchalant about leaving your door not just unlocked, but partially open. If it's just unlocked, anyone walking past would have to try to open the knob to realize that it's not locked, but any random walking past could notice if the door isn't even closed. She's lucky all that happened is she got screamed at. You're both lucky. New Karen neighbor steals my entire vegetable garden and gets caught red-handed. We have a not-so-small vegetable garden in the backyard of my family's house. Me and my mom are the gardeners, and we grow a bunch of zucchini, snap peas, herbs, broccoli, carrots, tomatoes, and even grapes with the occasional other vegetables, radishes, bell peppers, etc. One day, I hear something outside my window, which is right above the largest planter box in our garden. I look outside and I see two kids from the neighborhood picking vegetables from the planter box. I run out and see the two of them have their arms full of zucchini and carrots and even some tomatoes. I ask what on earth are they doing and they said, we live in the neighborhood. I told them that those are our vegetables and they can't just take them. They just said, it's our neighborhood too, we can have them if we want. And they took off before I could stop them literally vaulting over the small fence that separates our side yard from the neighbors. Different neighbors, not the ones that were stealing. A few days later, I heard something outside my window again, and I look out and I see the kid's mom loading a basket with vegetables from the planter. Again, I rush out and I see that her and her kids are loading baskets with everything they can grab. I watched as the mom grabbed a handful of the chives I had been growing and ripped them out, roots and all. My mom must have heard me run out because she came out as well. She yelled, asking what they thought they were doing, and the kids just kept picking vegetables, while the mom just turned annoyed. It's everyone's neighborhood, and we need the food, she said, still picking from the garden and desecrating my prized chives. My mom told her that if she had just asked, we would have given her some, and even if it is everyone's neighborhood, it's our garden. She just huffed and left with her kids, and there wasn't anything that we could do. Our garden was damaged beyond repair, our zucchini plants were torn to bits, and the peas and tomatoes were trampled and shredded, and our grapes brush that we had had for years was broken at the base, where one of them had stepped on it. There were no fresh vegetables that year, and my mom couldn't make her chocolate chip zucchini bread. A few days later, we installed a lock on the backyard fence, and the neighbors came banging on our door, mad that we installed a lock preventing them from getting into our garden. My mom just told them to go away, and if she saw them in our garden again, she would call the cops. We thankfully never saw them again, and our garden is happy now, and we managed to bring the grapes back to life. A little while ago, we planted some blueberry bushes in our front yard. Someone keeps stealing them, and half the blueberries are gone each season. We let the kids in the neighborhood eat them, but they only take like 8 to 10 each a day on weekends and during the summer. There are 10 bushes in total, about 100 to 150 blueberries each. Hmm, I wonder who's taking 500 blueberries each year. We haven't caught them yet, but everyone knows. Cameras, my friend. We all need to put up cameras. You only pay mileage for the shortest possible trip? Okay, then you have to pay my tolls. Plus update. At my job, every day I have to travel between two offices. I start at my main office, then have to travel to the second office, then back to my main office. Because I'm using my personal vehicle for this travel, the company pays me mileage. Well, there are basically two routes you can take between the two offices. One is about a mile round trip shorter, but has tolls. So I always took the one mile longer route and avoid the tolls. I did it this way for a year. Well, in comes the new bookkeeper, and she's heck-bent on saving the company money. And where does she think all of this wasteful money is going? Expense reports, obviously. So she starts nitpicking every report. Like if someone was out and has to buy some pens for work, she goes online and finds the cheapest price possible for those pens and only reimburses for that cheaper price. That obviously has upset several people. Well, she eventually decided to target me. I submit my report for two weeks and a few days later get the reimbursement payment. Well, it's $5.85 short. I ask her about it and she says I've been ripping off the company for the past year by taking the longer route between the offices. She will only pay mileage for the shorter round trip from now on. And I'm lucky she doesn't go back and take back all the extra from the past year. I say okay, but to please send me that, per her, I must take the shorter route and that this is company policy and leave her office. Before I even made it to the desk, I had the email from her confirming what she said. Two weeks later, I submit my expense report. 
I reported the shorter route, but the company saved $585, but tolls added up to $136. I reported the shorter route, so the company saved $5.85, but tolls added up to $136, a net loss for the company of $130.15. It's been six months, and I'm still taking the shorter route, costing the company an extra $130 every two weeks. Update. This extra cost to the company went on all last year. By my estimates, it cost the company about an extra $3,500. So the third week of December, we have our annual budget review with all the department heads. It's usually just a quick chit-chat about how things went over the year, then we all get a nice catered lunch. This year went a little different. First, Karen Bookkeeper asked that we have a projector set up in the conference room so she could give a presentation on how much she saved the company since she was hired at the beginning of the year. This was great for me. I prepared my own presentation. She starts off the meeting going over each department, going over the changes she's made to save money. Her big cherry on top of her savings was how much she saved by cracking down on excess expense reimbursements. Now, I should say here that she's not liked by any of the department heads. Most of the employees have complained to their department heads about her bull, and they've been forced to just take the complaints with no power to do anything about it. I, on the other hand, am a one-person department. So her presentation ends with a big hooray on how cutting down on expense reimbursements has saved the company a whole $3,500 last year. Then we start going over each department's budgets. Everything is going normally until they get to my budget. Wait, why is it so far over budget? My boss asks. And this is when my short PowerPoint gets played. I bring up the first slide. It's the slightly longer route I was taking between offices. I explained this was the route I was taking and what the mileage reimbursement was. The next slide was the new shorter route. I explained that Karen forced me to take this route because the mileage reimbursement was less, saving the company about $5.85 every two weeks, a little more after the mileage rate went up in July. Then I showed them the next slide of Karen's email. Included in that email is a part about this being final and there will be no further discussions on the matter. The final slide was all of the toll reimbursements I was paid over the year, including the approximate total year to date that was a result of this new shorter route. I explained that had I been able to discuss this matter with Karen, I could have explained that the shorter route had these extra tolls, and I said that's the reason I'm so over budget this year. The room was silent for what seemed like forever, then the owners of the company asked everyone, except Karen, to step out of the room for a few minutes. When the door opened back up, Karen walked out silent went to her desk, and started packing up her things. That was the end of Karen. Am I the jerk for not giving my daughter her education fund money? I have a PhD, and I'm only acting in her best interest. I, 54 male, have two kids, 23 daughter, and 21 male, with my wife, who's 52. When the kids were young, my parents set up education funds for both of them, which was very generous of them. My wife and I always expected our kids to attend college and then graduate school, as we have done. I have a PhD, my wife has a master's. Because of this, we decided not to use the funds for our kids' undergrad degrees and did not tell them about the money. My daughter has always been more into the liberal arts, while my son is more of a STEM guy. My wife and I worried about her ability to find a job, but she insisted on studying music and film in college. She was accepted to some top schools and chose to attend a rather expensive one, but she had scholarships to cover almost all of her tuition. Everything else, plus living expenses, was her responsibility. She lived in a very small apartment shared with friends in a not-so-nice area far from campus, but she was fine and learned how to budget effectively. After graduating, she luckily found a job that doesn't pay extremely well, but she enjoys and scrapped the idea of grad school. My son decided to do engineering, and he has also expressed that he had no interest in grad school. My wife and I were disappointed but accepted it since at this point he's already all set up with a very good job when he completes school. Since he did not receive as many scholarships as his sister, we decided to use his education fund to cover his tuition and living expenses. He was able to get a large and nice apartment of his own close to the school, which is important since his classes are so demanding and he needs a comfortable space to work. My daughter was confused and asked how he could afford this and he told her about the education fund. She called us and asked why she didn't have one and we told her she did. We just didn't use it because we hoped she would attend grad school. She seemed hurt by this and asked if there was any way she could have the money now. 
We explained that there would be a fee to simply withdraw the money for non-education use, and if we chose to do that, it would belong to her grandparents so they could put it towards their own use. She's been quiet and short when answering our texts and hasn't answered our calls at all since then. I know that it does seem unfair to her, but it's not really her money in the first place and she's no longer in college. Plus, her brother only received it for educational purposes and it wouldn't be right for her to just have it to spend now. Am I the jerk? Update. I understand the consensus is that my wife and I are the jerks. I texted my daughter to ask if she wanted us to withdraw the money for her and what she wanted to do. This was her response. I don't care. Maybe they can transfer it to the other grandkid who's five if the fee is seriously too much. I don't know about grad school. I haven't thought about it much recently. If I do apply, it wouldn't be for another couple years and I hadn't been counting on having any financial help in the first place, so it really doesn't even matter. Thanks for asking though. Update 2. My wife and I are discussing our daughter's response and our next actions to resolve the situation. For context, my wife has always had a strained relationship with my daughter and did not approve of many of her life choices. She believes we should take our daughter's words at face value and assume she no longer wants the money. From some of the responses here, I fear that my daughter's response was out of resentment and I suggested taking out as much money as her brother was given so at least they received the same amount. She could use it responsibly towards rent, groceries, transportation, etc. or in some other way to further her career so it would still be for educational purposes in a sense. My wife is standing firm in her opinion and we will continue talking it through tomorrow. Many have asked about where my parents stand on this. At this point, they are not mentally aware enough to really participate in the discussion. They did know about our grad school stipulation and thought it was fine. They also knew that we took out some money for our son once we were certain he was not pursuing an advanced degree and were fine with that as well. They said it was our decision as parents what to do with our daughter's fund and they would support whatever we decided for her. It wouldn't be useful to ask them what to do with it now, but I've always said that whatever is unused will go back to their care. I've tried to call my daughter with no luck, which is why I sent the text. Despite what many have said here, I hope this does not end our relationship. You're the jerk, and I'm surprised between your PhD and master's degrees, you couldn't figure that out. Edit, thank you everyone for all of the awards. I'm glad we can all come together as a community to call out OP's jerk behavior and mistreatment of his daughter. Massive you're the jerk. I feel for your daughter. It would be super hurtful to hear that your parents could have helped you but chose not to. You're a PhD for sure, but not the educational type. And the worst part was that the daughter was punished for getting scholarships and had to live in a crappy area with roommates while the son had a nice apartment on his own in a good area. Part of this, I believe, is judgment against her choices of going into the humanities as opposed to her brother who went into engineering and the implication that his studies were more rigorous. You're the jerk. Oh dear, just goes to show you that having a PhD and a master's degree does not make you a good parent or smart in any way. So let me get this right. Your daughter attended college and had a scholarship. Your son attended college with no scholarship. You chose to not let your daughter use her college fund for everything that her scholarship didn't cover and you let your son use his for everything. The college fund you said wasn't even her money, but it isn't yours either. What exactly do you plan to do with her college money? You're the jerk for this. Just FYI, if the edit you made is genuinely all the effort you made to put things right, you're pathetic. You need to give her the money and make up the difference for the fee as you've stolen her money. You're the jerk even after the edit. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Make me take PT every month, will you? I was in the US Army and the Army National Guard for over 20 years. I did finally get my pension, but I was ready to throw all that time away because of the inability of a first lieutenant to count to eight. We had an annual PT test scheduled as part of a drill weekend. A drill weekend consisted of four unit training assemblies or UTAs. Each UTA was equivalent to a day of active duty pay. The duty day started at 7 a.m., lunch at noon, final formation at 4.30 p.m., then released for the day unless an overnighter was on the training schedule. Promotions were contingent on passing the Army Physical Fitness Test as well as a bunch of other random qualifications such as military schools, professional development, military awards and decorations, rifle qualifications, civilian training and or schooling and college degrees. The APFT consisted of three events, push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run. 
It has since been changed, but that was what it was when I was in. I'm a natural runner. I ran track in high school. Tall and lean with good stamina. Not too fast, but I was steady. Six minute miles all day long. Sit-ups were never a problem for me. Push-ups, however, not much for upper body strength. I've always struggled with push-ups. It's the only event of the APFT that I ever actively trained. I could max out the other two events, but push-ups, I was happy if I could make the minimum required to pass the test. I was up for promotion. I trained push-ups for months prior to the test. On the day of the test, one of the smokers in the unit wanted to run with me to pace off of me so that he could pass the PT test. I did the required number of push-ups to pass that event and I was flying high, knowing the other two events were easy for me. We ran on a quarter mile high school track, eight laps for two miles, and as we passed our score, in this case, the idiot first lieutenant, we'd yell out our last name and he'd check off the completed lap. My buddy and I ran side by side for all eight laps and when we got to the last lap, the LT said I had another one to do. We explained that we ran together for all eight laps and if one of us passed, both of us passed, but he wasn't buying it. He made a mistake and couldn't admit it. He was adamant that I had to run another lap and because I was running slower than I normally would have to let the smoker keep up, I couldn't complete another lap in the time required to pass the test. I was marked as a PT failure and wasn't eligible for promotion. Because I was an NCO, there wasn't that many slots that opened up in a year in my job classification. The opening went to another NCO further down the promotion list than me. I was upset. My civilian job was in manufacturing. We worked a three-on, three-off schedule. I worked nights. Weekends were our big money weeks. In order to attend a drill weekend, I'd have to miss work Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday night. I would lose about $600 for attending drill. Occasionally, we could be approved for missing drill as long as we made it up during that month, or we could just take no pay for drill and miss those days towards creditable retirement. At some point, leadership decided that all PT failures would take a PT test every month until they passed. Failure to show up for the PT test would be an automatic forfeiture of pay and retirement points. Eligibility for retirement was based on having a good year. A good year was 50 points. Each UTA was one point. Annual training was 15 points, leaving 35 points needed from drill weekends. In a year, I could miss three drill weekends, and as long as I made all the rest, I was eligible for a good year. I saved those excused drills for the weeks I was scheduled to work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so I wouldn't lose the $600 difference for my civilian job and drill pay. Now back to the mandatory PT tests every weekend. Leadership decided that we couldn't miss the scheduled training, so the PT test would be held before drill at 5.30 a.m. at an armory 30 miles further away from my unit's armory. To be at the PT test armory on time for the test meant that I had to get up at 3.30 a.m., get dressed, drive almost two hours, then do the test. Cue malicious compliance. If I was going to be inconvenienced by this idiocy, so is my score. I would show up for the test, sign in, do one push-up, one sit-up, one lap, and call it good. Drive to my unit and report that I failed the PT test and go to work and still get paid every month. My first sergeant pulled me aside one day and asked what was going on. He said he knew I could pass the test. I explained that I already passed the test, but that the lieutenant never passed kindergarten counting. If they wanted to hold the PT test during duty hours, I'd be more than happy to try to pass, but there was zero incentive for me to do so as long as I had to drive two hours to take the test at 5.30 a.m. Another drill weekend, it snows quite a bit, and it slows my drive down, so I get to the PT test a few minutes after it started. The LT in charge said it was too late and I couldn't start now. Okay, whatever. Drive to my unit to report in that I wasn't allowed to take the test. Then I'm informed that I'm getting an unsat for refusing to do the PT test and wouldn't be paid for that UTA. Okay, if I'm not being paid, I'm leaving and will be back in four hours. Nope, if you leave, you'll get another unsat. I realized then, that means I don't have a good year. I'll only have 49 points. Forget it. I quit then. I had over 18 years in, re-enlisted for six more right before the failed PT test I passed and just walked away. No more stupid games and no more losing money. In years past, some National Guard units were known to carry soldiers on their rolls. The unit would report that the soldiers were present for duty when they were not and unit administrators would rocket their pay or create company slush funds. 
Sometimes, those soldiers were almost ready to collect pensions and were kicked out, and the state saved those pension payments. Now, after 18 years, soldiers are locked in and units are unable to discharge them. You can quit, like I did, and ask for a discharge and the National Guard Bureau will kick it back, denying it like they did with me. I still had four years on my current enlistment. They wouldn't and couldn't release me. Meanwhile, the State National Guard Bureau would get a report of soldiers not showing up for drill. My name kept appearing. Uncomfortable questions were asked. Why someone with all this time in at my rank would just walk away? My situation became an embarrassment for the state. How are they going to get my name off this report every month? Why did this happen? How did we fail a soldier with one year left until retirement eligibility? A friend of mine was a senior NCO, and in one of those meetings, he raised his hand and volunteered a way to get me off this list and not do anything illegal or fraudulent. I was transferred to his unit. I attended drill at this unit just a few miles from my house on my days off during the week and reported to him. All I needed was 50 points and that would give me a good year and I could retire with my 20 years in. I could also do military correspondence courses for retirement points, which wasn't available when I quit. When I attended enough UTAs and completed the courses, I got my 50 points. I received my eligibility for retirement letter and promised my friend he could have half of it. Unfortunately, my friend passed at age 55 a year or so after he finally retired after 30 plus years in uniform. At his funeral, another retired senior NCO spoke and reflected on my friend's ability to think outside the box and referenced my situation. Yes, I'm happily collecting my pension, but I'll never forget him and what he did for me. Am I the jerk for saying, sorry, I forgot you were my grandma, to my grandma? This happened fairly recently, but I was told that I was a jerk, so I wanted a neutral opinion. Context. I, 16 female, have always been the only grandkids along with my 17-year-old sister. Because of this, our grandparents spent a lot of time with us. Recently, however, my uncle and aunt had two kids, toddlers at the moment. Now on to the story. Recently, a close cousin of ours passed. Her funeral was two days after my birthday and one day after an orthodontist appointment of mine. This orthodontist appointment made it so it hurt to eat any food that wasn't soft, relevant later. Anyway, we went to the funeral and after that to the burial. Some of my grandma's family was buried there, so she asked me and my family to look for them and take photos of their graves for her. We did, but this took us about an hour and a half. So, when we finally got to the celebration of life, the food not only was cold, but also all gone. Now my uncle and his oldest toddler were with us at the ceremony too, so they arrived at the celebration of life with us. It's also worth mentioning, I hadn't really eaten anything all day except some snacks. So being that it was 2 o'clock, I was hungry. So I got food that was easy to tear apart and went to sit down. My grandma had my uncle's toddler and all of a sudden started taking my food to give to him. Mind you, I told her I couldn't eat much because my mouth hurt. Well, she ended up giving all of the food I could eat to my baby cousin, leaving me hungry. When I got upset, my grandma said, Sorry, I forget you're my granddaughter. I won't lie, that hurt, and I didn't talk to her for the rest of the day. Anyway, we were at my uncle's house two days after, and she asked me to do something for her, and in my genius moment I said, Okay, first name, I can do that. When she stared at me in confusion, I finally said, Oh, sorry, I forgot you were my grandma, in front of one of my aunts and my grandpa, not her husband. I could tell she tried to laugh it off, but it bothered her. I was told by my aunt I should apologize because I needed to be respectful, and that wasn't, but I still haven't apologized, and I don't plan to unless I really am in the wrong. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, I saw that some people are confused, so let me add more information. 1. Me and my grandma were really close when I was younger. 2. After I got food, I wasn't able to get any more. The kitchen staff was cleaning up by the time we got there. 3. The toddler's parents did have food. 4. Neither me or my grandma said what we said in a dead serious voice. We both had a sort of laughy tone. 5. I'm not sure why she said it, as some of you said it was random. Me personally, I felt like she went overboard with a joke, because to me, saying that isn't okay. 6. We both said this in front of people. It wasn't just me. 7. My grandma isn't that old. Early 50s. She doesn't have dementia. 8. This was at my mom's cousin's funeral. They were an adult. We were second cousins. 9. I do have a good family and me and my grandma just haven't talked about this since. 
That should be it. Let me know if I missed anything. Not the jerk. Of all the responses she could have given you after taking your food, she went for the one that was the worst. I'm so sorry. And as for respecting her, it's a two-way street. Not the jerk. You gave your granny just the medicine she needed. Just because they're older doesn't make them right. And the whole BS about respect. No, you have to earn respect. You don't just get it. Granny clearly was in the wrong here. She should apologize to you or at least tell you she understands why her comment hurt you. Not the jerk. If she can forget you're her grandchild, you can forget she's your grandmother. Not the jerk. Just because she's your grandmother doesn't mean she can treat you that way. It's hypocritical of your family to get mad at you, but let her get away with it. I'm sorry you have such a crappy family, OP. I feel for you. Am I the jerk for refusing to eat what's cooked for me 90% of the time? I, 28 female, do most of the cooking in my household, and maybe it's just because of how I was raised, but I always make something that everyone will eat. My mom didn't do that growing up, and I was forced to eat foods that made me ill. I won't go out of my way to make meals that someone will not touch due to not liking it. It's really not that hard to do this in my house because generally speaking, my kids and husband are not picky at all and don't have any safe foods or anything. Sometimes on an off chance, one of my kids won't eat the broccoli or potatoes, but like I said, it's rare to run into an issue because they aren't picky most of the time. I, on the other hand, don't like a handful of foods and I will not touch them. Like spaghetti is a huge one for me. I hate spaghetti. Beef stew, pot roasts of any kind, mashed potatoes, whipped are okay sometimes, meatloaf, Salisbury steak, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, etc. I can safely say that most of which I hate isn't even a taste issue. It's that I've eaten these foods so many times because either everyone in my house, husband especially, wants them 24-7 or someone from my childhood growing up did. I just can't stand any of those foods anymore and I will not eat it. I usually cook for my family and will make myself something small on the side if I make any of these meals. My husband knows what I like and I don't like. Whenever he cooks though, he always makes something I absolutely will not eat. Like potatoes. He literally wants potatoes with every meal, to a point where my kids are starting to hate them. And meatloaf or spaghetti. Those are his two go-to meals whenever he cooks and I won't eat it. Never have. He cooked yesterday while I was sick and made spaghetti. And when I woke up, he told me I needed to eat something. So I went out and grabbed something else, cheese and pepperoni, and he got upset that I didn't want to eat dinner. He said he hates cooking because I never eat it. I told him if it bothered him, then maybe he should stop cooking meals he knows I won't touch. He said I make it so that he doesn't want to cook at all. Am I the jerk? ETA. Most of the foods I listed either make me throw up or go right through me. We've been together since I was 15, so he knows this. He is also a chef day to day, but whenever he cooks at home, he sticks to meatloaf and potatoes or spaghetti. He never makes anything else with the exception of beef stew maybe once a year. ETA. I don't expect him to cook separately from me when he does cook. I have no problem cooking for myself. The issue is that he gets upset when I won't eat the food that he makes and I always make myself something different. I've never expected him to cook separately from me and I've never held it against him. So your chef husband says that you're at fault that he doesn't want to cook at home? You ever thought about the fact that he does this on purpose so that he doesn't have to cook? Not the jerk. Not the jerk. I don't understand the people who are saying anything else. He's making food you can't eat on purpose and then getting angry when you don't eat it. That's foolish and selfish on his part. Not the jerk from my perspective. I also was subjected to the I made it, you eat it trope as a kid and there are things I just don't want to eat. As an adult in charge of my own body, I see no reason to consume things that I don't enjoy when there are plenty of healthy things I do. You didn't expect him to make you something else. You simply didn't eat what he made and provided your own. My husband likes to make Guinness stew, which I won't touch, and he's not offended when I don't. Guests need to know you're human too. So I do lots of things in the restaurant I work at, and one of those is front of house work. It's a very nice part of my job. I love organizing tables, it's good brain exercise and you can have a lot of fun small talk with people. However, I don't control reservations. That's being done by my bosses, who are awesome mostly. This means I come in and start my shift and have to work with what I have, which usually isn't too bad. On this particular day, I come in a little early and a waitress greets me with, Today's going to suck. Your front of house? My condolences. She's not one for overreaction, so I know to brace myself. 
I take the iPad we use for organizing reservations. First three hours look fine, but then mayhem will break loose. And we are overbooked. Our restaurant usually has around about 180 seats. We had reservations for roughly 250 people, including a group of 100 people who had flat out booked one complete room, which gives me less space to work with. Now, 70 people more than seats per evening isn't bad per se, like a four top can be used three or four times for groups after each other. But that evening, I had roughly 20 seats too few, so I got to work. I got out extra seats from the back. I got out extra seats from outside. I got out extra seats from the attic. Me and a waiter carried down two extra tables from the attic, which was a pain, honestly. And I rearranged a ton of stuff, both in how tables were standing and in how they were reserved. In doing so, I noticed a note in one of the reservations. Once this table, we'll get angry if not possible. I sigh. It would help to assign them a different table, so I do. I work blood, sweat, and tears for three hours and finally have the restaurant in a shape that's halfway prepared. People start trickling in. The staff is in top form, places stacked to roof. Now the reservation I switched around arrives, older guy with his family. He tells me his name and that he specifically requested a table, which is something we explicitly don't do by the way. You just can't promise people that. I tell him, sorry, very, very busy tonight. We had to rearrange you. However, the table is similar in size and in position. Would you please follow me? As promised, he starts winding up and gets angry. How can this be? Is everyone incompetent these days? You know the spiel. So I look at him in full earnest and ask him, do you want to make me cry? He's clearly taken aback. I elaborate. I've worked like a madman for the past three hours to get this place to a shape where we can use it today. I didn't overbook this, and if I could have given you your table, I would have, but I can't. And I really got through to him. His anger dissipated, he apologized for bursting out and politely asked me to speak to my bosses about the overbooking, which I did, and they were very understanding and helpful. They sit down and have a good night. That was one of the worst shifts of my life. I'm not easily stressed, but phew. However, I'll remember that interaction as a positive. Thanks for reading, and I hope you have a good day. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.